Great. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome you tonight to our uh, um, our uh, presentation. And uh, we may, uh, just a fair warning, we've already had some people trolling tonight. So we'll boot them out at the first sign of any problems. Um, Second of all, Charlie is going to be presenting in Louisville. Third of all, this is a no smoking zone, so let's put out the darts, boys. Come on. Well, that's not the Ellen we know. Ellen, oh, let's know block. That, I know that I'm booting them out. Block everyone. Yeah. Block everyone. Okay, I just got you them. don't know them. Block, block them. I know. Mute everyone. It's. Well, everyone's here. We're just booting them out. Okay, now, um, let's start again. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. Like I said, our speaker wound up Thank going you. to the hospital tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief introduction, uh, an announcements period. Then we'll have our main speaker who then comes in. And after that, we will have our... Um, presentation given by Charlie Paydock tonight, who is speaking in lieu of our speaker. Then we will have our question and answer period. And then afterwards, we'll have our rebuttal period. We generally finish up about nine o'clock and we'll be making a lot of uh, things going on. So welcome everybody. Charlie, if you're ready to uh, do the announcements, I'll get started on that real quick. Okay. okay, Tim, would you kindly block everyone, everyone except me? That's what I'm doing. I'm doing that just now. Wait, we all have to leave or? No, we're just muting everybody so that we can uh, let Charlie have the floor. I mean, it's it's not that. Oh, uh, please. Don't do that, will but, you uh, do it? Okay. Give me a minute, please. Okay. We're ready. Charlie, go ahead. All right. I don't see X's on everyone. Because but... I haven't shared the screen yet. I've got it now. Uh, now we're good. Go ahead. All and start. right. Welcome everyone to meeting number 3,665 of the College of Complexes, College of the playground for people who think. Uh, as a little at the beginning, I'll just remind everyone that we have a uh, Google group, Google email group, or a meetup group, which functions in the same way. And you get one or two notices of upcoming meetings. Charles, be There's quiet. A... Tim, please block everyone except me. Uh, so there's instructions on the website you know, on how to join these. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On May the 14th, the Truth Brigade will be here. Indivisible Illinois uh, will be helping to helping us Charles, to be quiet. between uh, what is true and what is false. Uh, okay, that's May 14th. On May the 21st, uh, we'll be looking at health disparities and long COVID. Uh, we'll be taking a re-examination of the pandemic and what's going on with BA.21 and so forth. But the, uh, co the coverage regarding uh, COVID. On May the 28th, we're going to hear about the right-wing attempts to take over school board and public meetings and the curriculum of schools uh, with a right-wing agenda. So this is a movement out of Chicago uh, to, to cut or curb uh, the uh, Trumpers, so to speak, uh, from asserting their agenda. Transitioning into June 4th, our own Robert, Professor Bob Lichtenberg hang on, will be hang talking. On giving instructions on how to make meaning. Charlie, hey, hold uh, on. He's the author of several books. Tim, please cut these guys. No, that was me, Charlie. 
Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You, I just was having trouble syncing the screen. All right. Thank Go ahead. you. June the 4th. Uh, our own Bob Lichtenberg will be here. On June the 11th, we're going to have a debate between Reverend Charlie Earp and Justin Tucker on uh, was Jesus a communist? So this should be a I, hot evening. I have, a, I have a question. I have a question about that. Sorry. No, no, Joe, Will you please this is not zap the him. time to ask zap questions. Him now. Will, zap will, him. will you kindly zap him? He's, he's, Thank he's, you. He's, That's he's all you have up. to do. All right. Can you do that? Yes. All right. I don't want to have to say it at one more Charlie, time. Charlie, get with your announcements, please. Will you zap them? I okay. have, Charlie. All right. Uh, June the 18th, Dan Bader will be returning. And he's going to, he's a community psychologist. We'll be talking about people with the illness of hoarding. Okay, transitioning June 25th is open. If you'd like to make a presentation, I'd like to hear from you. Send me a title and a description and we'll uh, confirm the date. We've got a tentative booking already on um, progressive uh, rank choice voting. Uh, someone uh, will be speaking possibly on that. Also the other openings then will be June 9th, 16th, 30th. Okay, 23rd. All right. Um, added to the schedule is on June the 2nd is World UFO Day. And it's a topic we have not covered in many, many years. But uh, we may uh, we're putting together a program on specifically, it is the 75th anniversary of Roswell the uh, famous incident in New Mexico. So we'll be looking at that, the incident at Roswell. Okay, that's about it. Now let's get going with the regular program. Uh, our regular speaker, Gene Lentz notified me this morning that he was being taken to the hospital. So he had to fill in. Fortunately, he sent me a recording which I've listened to several times. I illustrated his talk uh, in PowerPoint and uh, have listened to it. He gave this on Thursday at the college. And given my own background, I have almost 40 years now of experience in the organized labor movement in both the public and private sectors. From organizing units, health and safety, uh, grievance arbitration was my primary responsibility. I'm a lecturer in labor law, so it, hopefully I can cover what Gene was going to do. So let's share the screen, Tim, if you could, please. Uh, you can share the screen if you're going to share the PowerPoint. Oh. You share it and you control it. Oh, okay. I, I can unshare you, but I can't share you. Okay. I it's there we go. All right, now it, you uh, gotta click on your uh, PowerPoint because there's gotta... yeah, I know. Thank you. All right, welcome. This is the thing. Our special May Day. Every May Day we do a presentation, um, specifically on issues relevant to the organized labor movement and the status of it. Okay. Um, What happened? You just unshared, Charlie. Uh, go ahead and share again with your uh, PowerPoint. I didn't touch my. No, you you unshared by mistake. I don't know. Just I share. didn't touch my computer. Okay, it, it started again, and. Uh... Well, you, Tim, that was you. Are all right. Okay, go ahead, Charlie. Okay, Gene. Uh, uh, this was down in our other campus, the college. Uh, they were marking the how Tim, we got you again. I know that somebody is unsharing. Okay. Tim. 
Tim, it's Bob Matter. Can you hear me? A little closer belongs to me. Somebody's fucking. Okay. Yeah, uh, Tim, you need to delete Joe. J O. No. Knock him out. He's a hacker. Get I'm sorry. That was not me. That was not me. Get rid of him. Get rid of him, Tim. Get rid who, of this who, guy who, too. Get rid who, of this who's, guy. Who's Edwin Miller? Get rid of him too. All right, we're removing them. And don't let it, don't let anybody back in tonight. If they're not here, they're not in. They're not in in the in crowd. Then they fuck them. Then they missed it. So don't let anybody else in. These are these are just hackers. I've already removed them. So go ahead. Start sharing your screen again, Charlie. I do not know how they're getting the administrative control on this. All screen. right. No, because you're letting him in. That's why. Well, we're not going to anymore. No, listen. Do your job, please. All right. The uh, They marked the occasion in Texas by having a picnic and sing-along uh, for the first time. They were acknowledging the event that took your, it, it place in Chicago in 1886 and uh, marking the occasion as they do in other cities around the world. Uh, there was an event um, here in Chicago, Illinois, an organization to which I'm affiliated, the IWW. They uh, lay roses and have a memorial out at the cemetery, uh, uh, marking the grave sites of the Haymarket Martyrs. Uh, some people say it was a Haymarket Riot. Uh, union people call it a Haymarket Affair. Nevertheless, I'll give you a little bit of the history later on, but that's a cemetery right here in Chicago in which there is a commemoration uh, every May Day. Um, one of the things, uh, I, I won't say it anymore, but Gene was talking about there's there's some good news regarding organized labor this year. Um, we're seeing employees at Starbucks uh, cracking into the franchises around the nation, uh, which is a significant number of them. But within the first couple of weeks, more than 50 Starbucks locations across the nation have filed for union elections. And this was a dramatic breakthrough. I, in fact, was involved by, called in by some Starbucks employees many years ago in Chicago for advice on organizing the union, but they weren't quite ready yet. Uh, they hadn't developed issues and so forth. And I kind of left them at that because they weren't quite at the level yet uh, for forming a, a union and all that was conceivably involved. Um, there's been also, if you look down, a company seeing collective bargaining uh, nationwide uh, at any number of locations, most notably Amazon. Okay, this was just the thing. Uh, yeah, this is occasion, and it's good to see that unions are getting back to the tradition of having their picnics. This is a union tradition, and it shouldn't be relegated strictly to Labor Day. Okay. Uh, uh, now, the other thing that Gene was talking about, and this has been in progress for many, many years, even though the employees at a location may vote to be recognized by a union. There is a difficulty in getting a contract, the initial contract. Uh, employers would pose, will do anything um, to preclude coming to the table and negotiating is bargaining in good faith. One of my principal responsibilities uh, as a union official was to negotiate. I wrote contracts and negotiated them as the chief negotiator on many occasions, and in particular, new units, subsequent to our winning a union election. As a little story, I was sent down to Atlanta, Georgia, in which we had uh, 
picked up a unit of a thousand employees. Um, and I was responsible for negotiating the contract. I, I went to the location, which we were scheduled to do. And I was informed by the employer that not only would they not engage in any collective bargaining, if I came back to that facility, uh, they would call the security and have me apprehended by the police department of Atlanta. I did in fact go back the next day with two representatives from the United States Department of Labor. And then they kind of changed their mind and they kind of agreed with me. But anyhow, that's, that's what you're up against. Uh, these employers will, will hire specific law firms intending to keep out the unions and they'll spend any amount of money financing for any extended period of time. But if you have union officials that are tenacious and skillful, these obstacles can be overcome. Some of the things like everyone may have seen that movie, Norma Ray, what is left out of that movie was that, that, that those activities took eight years to unionize that facility to make towels. Okay, um, let's see, the next one was, um, prior throughout human history, um, uh, Gene talks about how most people were, worked in slave-like conditions. Things were made and produced, goods and services were provided through a system, if not pure slavery, and are about the condition of slavery such as the peasants in the Middle Ages who were struck on the land. Now, of course, we're getting away from that. Um, and the, the, of course, slavery was a benefit to a narrow group of individuals who- Can you show the whole screen uh, picture? Not the side thing? There, all right, how's that? That's good, all right. Now we got it, CTA. Sorry, thanks for telling me. Okay, um, anyhow, you had two classes, uh, the managerial class that evolved with the development of free market capitalism, the managerial class, largely the abs, and the hybrid classes, uh, and I would call them the have-nots. So you had a dichotomy developing, a uh, social stratification taking place. Uh, now this was called, for many the years were operative legally, you were termed the condition of free labor, meaning you were free to leave anytime you wanted. However, that free, freedom was conditional that you had some other means of support. So I don't know to what extent it could be genuinely called free because people simply don't have the freedom to pick up and leave when they want. Uh, it's, it's what I call people are like captured pieces. And this is in a very existing situation. Individuals, uh, I've known this for a fact, and employers know this, if you hire someone, like say a guy with a family and a mortgage, he's not likely to cause you any problems. So in terms of this status, this term free labor, it was anything but free labor. Okay, turning events. Now there was a movement, the first real movement of organized labor worldwide was to achieve an eight hour day. And they wanted eight hours work, eight hours for us, and eight hours for what you will. Uh, you may have heard of organizations such as the Knights of Labor and so forth. Um, uh, now, there was a lot of strike activity attendant to this and labor actions, uh, most notably here in Chicago. And there were several. Uh, uh, skirmishes outside of workplaces, McCormick Reapers, 
uh, was the major one. Nevertheless, there was a union gathering in the Haymarket, which is just uh, uh, um, and at the Plains and Alston Streets. So um, now the meeting went along peaceably. As a matter of fact, it was raining, and the mayor had even been there, mayor of Chicago, and he left. And it looks like the whole thing was just going to be over. It was a meeting called on short notice. Nevertheless, it didn't look like anything was going to take place. However, uh, depending on whose account of this you tend to, uh, the police went uh, marched into the crowd. And out of that erupted what could easily be termed a riot. Uh, and in the course of that action, a bomb was thrown. Um, no one has ever been able to identify who threw the bomb. Uh, some even say that it may have been the police themselves who were responsible for the explosion. Nevertheless, it has been termed as a Chicago riot. And there you see, I was in a recreation, a movie, and I was designated as the person for the film to throw the bomb. Okay, now eight, uh, eight individuals all together, these are the six that were um, put in prison, were apprehended and held accountable for the event. Uh, many of them had not even been there. Nevertheless, they were held responsible for it. Four of them were hung uh, accused there was just something of a pretend trial and they were executed and that's why we term them DA market martyrs. Um, uh, regarding the eight hour day, um, it took another considerable period of years and technically never was really achieved until 1938 and passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act which looked at things such things as child labor and overtime. And this is still the law that is used today in the event you submit a claim. The hot dog stand a block away from my house, um, the employees, this was somewhat amazed me. It's a pretty good size place, but nevertheless, the employees there had been cheated out of overtime pay and and uh, minimum wage, and the settlement came to over half a million dollars um, that they're compensated by. You have to have good records, and apparently these guys knew what they were doing because you have to have the burden of proof is on you uh, that you worked that many hours and in fact were cheated. Okay, this again, this the opposition was out there. Um, the uh, Andrew Carnegie's of the world who, who uh, uh, worked in opposition to any sort of legislation, uh, reform legislation. Now, during this period, uh, just after 1886 through the Depression, the, the unions were, in fact, in many locations, illegal. They were considered a criminal conspiracy, engaged in restraint of trade and imposing themselves on the personal property of the owners, whom we just saw. Now, one of the organizations that defied the law and still exists today, obviously, is the IWW, the Wobblies, who sought not only, they sought organization of all working people. That's why they see terminology, uh, workers of the world. Um, the union came after them in an in incredible fashion. The, uh, the officers of the organization uh, were in fact, uh, warrants were issued. They were accused of even committing murders. Most notably, this began in, this organization began in Chicago in 1905 
uh, with such dignitaries as uh, Mother Mary um, uh, was among at the or, original meeting um, uh, of the IWW. Okay, uh, during the 30s, uh, certainly the unions were looked at given more attention, given, the, of course, the, the situation regarding employment. Uh, not only were people looking more towards organized labor for remedy, but they were also looking uh, overseas uh, towards communism and socialism. Um, the, uh, here you see some of the materials they were passing around. There was no depression in the Soviet Union none were experienced and many looked upon this as a, 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 a viable solution to free market capitalism. Okay, and they would listen to Comrade Lenin, like this young boy here, or these peasants, that there'd be promise of a better world. Okay, now I don't agree necessarily with Gene on this, but after the 30s, through the 40s and 50s, uh, there's some accusations made against organized labor that they became business unions. And they were conducting themselves in a fashion much like the people they were opposed to. And they should not have adopted uh, uh, any sort of let's say business mannerisms of operation. This is a concept somewhat like you pay dues and you get a service. Meaning if you need assistance, you, you, you uh, uh, go then see a union official and they have employees uh, trained and skillful to assist you uh, seeking a remedy either your grievance or potential disciplinary action. The other model is called an organizing model in which you enlist the enthusiasm and solidarity of all employees in a workplace so that they feel a sense of ownership, uh, so forth. This is why something like a union picnic is a good activity because it's not just uh, a sterile arrangement. It, it is a, a functioning element of, of, of the people's lives. Anyhow, there's, this is a guy, Teamster Boss, despite I'm not in, in agreement necessarily there. I believe also that there was a maturation in how do we deal with this. And I, I have to tell you that um, labor law has gotten more complex and it's conceivably beyond the, uh, the skills of any, anyone on the shop floor. Not to, we do operate schools and so forth, but it's, it's gotten that way. Uh, and so that's what I mean. Now this, I always like the Teamster bosses. Say what you want about them, they, got the, they delivered. Uh, anyhow, that was some of the thing in the 40s that they were on the take not interesting in improving your conditions. I must admit, I know of one or two corrupt unions who really didn't act too assiduously on behalf of the employees. Uh, that has changed over time. So that's what I mean. It, it, these things are not permanent features and even organizations that I knew that I had very little regard for personally um, changed under new leadership and became stellar organizations. Um, okay, the other thing that happened during this period was early in the time they looked upon migrant labor as somewhat taking jobs away from Americans and the unions uh, eliminated this way of thinking and said, no, these are workers just like us, and they should be organized um, in that fashion. Uh, okay. Now, 
do not say, what is the future now for the organized labor movement? Uh, some people think that we should continue large scale uh, activities in the old fashioned mode where you uh, are, are either bring its business operations to all or encumber operations until the employer is willing to agree to the terms or conditions or come to the table. Um, another people seem to think that there's a legislative remedy. Uh, that's why in the last election, uh, the generally went with the Democrats uh, thinking that this would uh, bring results or favorable decisions by on behalf of, of the government of the United States for the working people of the nation. I will tell you one thing in an insight that when Republicans are in power, this has taken place and it happened in the last administration and the one before that. The Republican party will not enforce the labor laws of the United States. You can file a charge and nothing will happen. You can file another one. They will take the papers, file it away in a filing cabinet and forget about it. But without any enforcement action, they're in effect nullifying the labor laws of the United States. Wait a minute. What are we doing here? All right. Now, another another approach that is recommended is uh, the boycott uh, or slow cardio. There's uh, things that happen. I should add, I'm getting a little out of myself. In 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act was passed. Now, this is somewhat an anti-union piece of legislation. And this basically brought it in to many of the activities that unions had relied on. Uh, so you could say there was a backlash. Uh, boycotts are not really permitted under the terms of it. Now, in organized situations for the farm workers, um, the, they are not within the framework of the Wagner Act. And therefore they like the farm workers can in fact and boycott lettuce, grapes and so forth campaigns and strawberries most recently. So when they passed the Wagner Act, in 1935, the only way they were able to get the votes of the Southerners, Southern Democrats at the time, was if they agreed to exclude uh, domestic employees and farm workers from the, 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 labor, the, the time and attendance legislation and the ability to organize the union. So that's what I mean. Some think that actions of this nature are the way to go. Other ones think there should be all in all out and out revolution in which you take to the streets uh, and have one big union and overthrow capitalism uh, root and branch. Not a bad idea, I could see that. Okay, anyhow, that's basically it. Thank you very much. And I hope you will join with me to build back better with unions and pass the PRO Act. All right, thank you, Tim. Well, it looks like, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, I uh, again, I apologize for the hacks, um, but I hope everybody is uh, ready to go. We're now into our question and answer period. That means please unmute and uh, we're ready to start with questions. Charlie, uh, the, my first question is, do you see any good coming from an employer at all? Or uh, what may be ready for an employer? Like they do things like provide jobs or do you think we should be under some kind of government control and uh, government controlling the means of production? Yeah, I, I think all, I, I believe certain industries and 
should be nationalized immediately. Uh, if you like authoritarian arrangements, that I don't know why any, but no one in their right mind would like working under a coercive situation in which someone is in charge. And this notion that they provide work, the, the, the where, where did you come, where do you come up with this? Are you, are you, are you brainwashed? They don't um, produce, labor creates all well. Well, that's the only way. You know another way to do it, <sighs> let me know. But that's the only way it's done. So you're basically saying that we should nationalize all industries and put them under some kind of central control, right? I haven't really done the world of the future. Uh, if they're willing to have, uh, I imagine you could arrive at middle ground arrangements, which they have. Uh, Tim, Tim, you're not doing your job. It was just removed. Okay. Yeah, are, how are, Tim, how are these people, are you letting these people in? Don't you, don't you have to allow, doesn't the moderator have to allow somebody in? When uh, they, I do they, allow them, but we've had two more. Well, what are you allowing anybody Why are you for? allowing them in? We've had get, a, rid of, get rid of three, one, get rid of this phone caller. The and phone I don't know. Who, Jake, I think. Jake, is that you on, on the phone? Yes. Jake, is that, are you there? I, well, I get rid of him. He can call back if it's Jake. Would you or Brown. not allow anyone in? Get rid of them. We've had Will you kindly not allow anyone in? Yep. We're not letting anybody in. We've All right. Now I'm going to answer the question. Get rid of Bob Matty. Get rid of them. Yeah, you need to get rid of Harold. Uh, get rid of the phone caller. I don't know who Steve Grossman is. I'd get rid of him. Grossman no. said he was logged in before. All right. That's me. I'm Grossman. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Nobody, nobody else in then. Well, this guy on the call, it's either Jake or Brian. Get rid of him. Get rid of him. No, they're there. He, they're he can call they're back. Him. Get rid of him. He's not responsive. Get rid of him. He's, he's there. He's not. He's not. Get rid of him. He's not responding. Get rid of him. Is there a second Charles? Uh, yes. Yeah. That's fine. my nephew. Okay. That's his name. Okay. Get rid of that phone. Get rid of that phone caller. Uh, I think uh, Tim. I just did. Okay. All right. I'll answer your question. No, not all anybody else in. I think we're. I think we're good to go now. Now you have, in order to have a, a viable situation, he's looking for the perfect world. You'd have to have an enforcement agent, a Department of Labor, that truly enforce uh, violations unfair labor practice charge. Not like we have today, where suddenly they can disappear because another political party takes power or, or and enforces the laws. There's also, actually there's legislation, people don't realize this, it's nationwide legislation protecting women in the workplace and granting leave for childbirth. But there's violations of that every day of the week and no one to enforce it. So it might as well be legislation in no land, cloud legislation. And you have to have penalties, monetary penalties. That's proposed under the new legislation. You have to levy fines. Now, if you're willing to do all of that, yeah, I'll sit down and talk with you. You're just talking about, oh, some, some employer, it's, oh, they create jobs, they didn't create nothing. Let me tell you how it works. 40% of your workday is only is to pay your wages and benefits. The other 60% creates money that goes into profits for the owner. It's lopsided to begin with. So you, after all that is kept that's how unevil the situation is. And this is a situation, to my mind, I, for me, I can't figure out why you would advocate it. It's not even fair. Well, Charlie, I think uh, 
we don't need to get involved with it because it's uh you need capital to create wealth you need people with no ideas to get things in here but i'm gonna i'm gonna save my i, I think the soviet union was going to the moon i thought they didn't have any ideas charlie you know the thing is capitalism I thought they were all like dumbbell lazy dumbbells right charlie, i've got a question go ahead go ahead uh, uh, it's me steve go ahead uh charlie you seem to think democrats are better for uh the labor movement than republicans and i'm remembering when obama held the presidency and both houses of congress and didn't pass the uh uh what's it called now Free the, choice pro act. Act. the pro act no yeah, it was the Free Choice Act. Yeah, he didn't push it through. He, he uh, yeah, you're right. He cut out, it, it was the time. No one was going to anticipate that Congress was going to switch so, so much so. They thought there was time. Sensitive issue. Was it the correct decision? Obviously not. Obviously Was not. it a renege? Now, the thing you have to, in the day-to-day -day operation, you have to realize that there's an enormous amount volume of legislation. And I can assure you from dealing with Congress on an ongoing, I'm, that's my, my real specialty is, is, is congressional affairs, is that the Democrats will meet with you and listen to you and support you. And the other guys will not. Only if you can offer them a deal for something they want. You have to you have to give them something like a big tax break or something. Those are the only conditions under which they will agree to meet with you and discuss. And the depth of their opposition to organized labor is very, very deep. Well, I agree with that, of course, but uh, the Democrats have not, to me, seemed much more responsive to the needs of organized labor. They talk about it more, but policy-wise and uh, in terms of legislation, I don't see the Democrats as a labor-friendly party. Well, that's why individuals do not perceive in the presentation. Gene offered different ways that people think what should be done in the future. Now the legislative is only one route. Some people want to have a revolution. Some people want to mess up every company individually. So which one do you want? If you don't like that one, I like it. I think it has results. There is some reason, yes, that you will never legislate socialism. Uh, it's, there's even a branch came out of Great Britain. However, it was achieved in that nation. And so it can in fact succeed. Uh, I don't know if we're ready. The fact of the matter is ultimately they are the deciding officials. And I told you I deal in labor law. And if you want to, those have to be improved or gotten rid of. Listen, look what happens in these red states when these Republican legislatures you don't want to deal with the Democrats? Go ahead, deal with those Republicans. In those states where they pass those crazy laws, incredible laws, you'll that make it impossible to have any employee rights whatsoever. That's Actually, what I mean. Yeah. That's the alternative you left with. I like the Wobblies. Uh... One big union general strike strategy. Yeah, well, I'll sign so. you up, brother. Come and join us at the meetings. Retirees can get along six bucks a month, a little contribution. Some young people, they're doing good work. We got about 10 organizing drives in Chicago in progress. All right. I've, seen, I've All right. seen them at demonstrations. I know they're around. Yeah, I, I admit the Democrats, you don't get what you want, but you persevere, and who knows, every now and then. I give lectures, as I say, on labor laws, 
believe you me, there it's very rare that we get labor laws passed on our behalf. And there is some very good valid reason to sure. believe that the legislature will never look kindly upon the working people of the United States. Let's face it, all and the there's... power, where's the money and power? Yep. I mean, they. I go see a congressman and say, please, Mr. Congressman. And the guy ahead of me, some big fat guy gives him a check for $25,000. And you want to give them more power. I mean, that's that's the I irony mean, in all this. I want to put them on trial. <laughs> no, you don't. You want to give them more power. You want to, you know, it's like Bernie and we'll all the rest. Of, I mean, all they Bernie, want more power, more money. Ryan, and where in my talk do you, do you hear that I want to give CEOs more power? No, you want to give the government. I'm going to send power. you a copy, and you can look it over, and you can tell me where I said more power. And influence should be given to CEOs. No, you want yeah. to give more power to the government that works on yeah, behalf of, of CEOs. I mean, it's like you see, you you say this stuff, right? Like the corporations control the government, the rich people control the government, and then you say we need to give the government more power. All right. So why? Yes, so the rich people can why. have more power over people? I mean, that here's is exactly why. what you're doing. Here's why. There was a movement in the 1900 called the anarchists. And it didn't mean that they didn't, they wanted no government. Mm. But in the day, let's face it, who are, who are the competing things? You've got employees, employers, and the government. And in order to win. Oh, no, but, but you forget in about order consumers. To win, what about I consumers? Used to have the government working on behalf of the employees. Simple. That's the real world, man. All right. So so here's a here's a little thought for you and your lefty friends, right? You don't like the way some corporation treats their employees? Don't buy their stuff, right? I, I mean, so the thing is, it is, is nothing in your in the world of the Democrats, nothing can happen without government. You are completely impotent, right? All this evil is happening around you, blah, blah, blah. And unless you get the government to do something about it, the evil will just continue. Because you yourself and, and, and the rest of the Democrats are just impotent as people, right? You know what so, I think? I think I don't think employees should be allowed to operate and produce products unless it's done fairly and equitably. Then don't do buy mean? their products. I got to come along. Then don't buy their products. It's, it's crazy, Wait a Charlie. This is don't buy their difficult. products. You want to allow everybody to mistreat all the employees, and then I have to come along later and clean up, clean up the so, mess. So you know what, though, Charlie? I mean, you're Black talking about logical. employers mistreating, you know, employers back mistreating and, employees. Yeah, logic, it, is, it is the government that has created all these labor laws. It is the government that allows this stuff. And, and you sit there like this is some kind of, like it just cropped up yesterday. Employers are beating up on their employees. Hey, no shit, huh? That's the 1920s labor union movement. I mean, that happened. That's been happening. Ryan, so you know, you. What, what have you accomplished by giving all this power to the government? You're still preaching about the same issues 80 years later. A hundred years later. Can I talk? Go, go sure, ahead. comrade. Uh, I told right, you, comrade, go ahead and talk. <laughs> I went to see an employer once. And he welcomed me in. He sat, I sat us down. And he listened to us. And then he looked up and he looked at me and he said, who the fuck are you? I said, all right, and I left. My partner wanted to argue with him. I said, no. He said, who the fuck are you get out of here? I said, he got up and left. And again, it was the next day I went back with a representative of the Department of Labor. And I arranged a meeting with that same individual. And I went, turned to the government guy. And I said, would you kindly explain to this gentleman, oh. who the fuck I am? Oh, okay. And and who are you? Why why should he give a shit what you think? It's called an unfair labor practice charge. That's why. An unfair labor ch practice charge. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. That's what you file against the employer. Now there's certain certain violations. 
Okay. There's all right. Like so, so, all know. right. So, what part of that? Where, where's no. you just not buying their stuff as a person, oh. right? You as an individual, right? Um, I mean, you know. So, take Amazon, right? You know, all minute, you're always, you all your always bitching about you, Amazon, huh? You, hey, you ever crazy. buy anything off of Amazon, Charlie? You got an Amazon Prime account that you're always bitching about what an evil company they are? <laughs> Listen, you start. Do you? Do you got an Amazon Prime account? You give those evil corporations your money. This, this is the voluntary part of it, right? The voluntary part of it is you support that corporation. And unless the government does anything about, you know, their mistreatment of their employees, you yourself won't do shit. You'll continue to buy Amazon Prime and all the rest of your shit off there. So I don't know, Charlie. I mean, your credibility, I mean, as far as like being all principled, do I don't know, man. Listen, I I, I'm straining over here. If, you're, if, they, if that's all you can do is kill the messenger, I win. What messenger? What messenger? Hey. You, the, you, you're just you're just sitting there. No, you, because you. because Charlie, the thing is that you yourself have I no. It, it's like unless the government does something, that's it. I, I mean, that's the end the of it. Calendar, it's don't like how do you address back. how do you address evil things that are happening in society? Well, you got to lobby government, and then maybe somebody in the government will give a fuck what you're what you're talking about. And in the meantime, the up, evil will just prevail. Doesn't it make sense to set up a structure for operating? economics in the United States, an orderly process that all should follow. And okay, so, against so yeah, how, how much why, power and money do why these are people you need against, to do that? Why are you against an orderly process? I'm not, I'm not. How much money and power do these people need to do that? What do they do? What do they do? Keep uh, the street lights on? Keep the roads? I mean, what? Let's move on. Next question. This guy's exhausting. So what, 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 when they need 50% of our income? And had, have all these laws that they could put us in cages for just to keep the roads and the lights on? I, I mean, give me a break, Charlie. Charlie Brian is an active member of our college thing here, and I think he uh, has basically challenged your views on this stuff. Yeah, he's supposed to mind no personal attacks. <laughs> but, you know, because Charlie, you know, I fundamentally disagree saying? with you, too. What, you know, saying? what, is, my, what is my personal purchasing habits have to do with the college complexes, Mr. Chair. Well, the personal purchasing habits are you, as that means you- See, that's a good example there. If so you got a guy like this, who's, who's the administrator, yeah, it's not gonna work. Well, Charlie- He doesn't want to enforce the rules. All right, Bob, if are you ready, are you ready to blast uh, that's Charlie? It, that's why people are anarchists. <clears throat> yeah, Charlie, um, what's, a, what's labor's opinion now of the- uh, of all the immigrants coming over illegally, uh, pouring across the southern border, a couple hundred thousand a month. All are welcome. In, all are welcome in the house of labor. Wasn't uh, wasn't wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't Chavez against uh, illegal immigrants? No, no, I I'm not aware of that. What are you talking about? The, Hugo uh, Chavez. Whatever the great the great. The guy from the United Farm Workers. No, I've he... never heard that. Wasn't he against? I, I heard that's what I heard. I worked for him. No, no <clears throat> more. So the more the merit. So the we're going to have all the. I paid the over. California as an organizer representing employees. Now all are welcome in the House of Labor. And I told you. The AFL-CIO adopted a pro-immigrant policy many years ago, and they are organizing people. Labor law does not distinguish between citizens and non-citizens. It's an, an inadmissible question. If you're in a hearing, you don't ask, are you a citizen or not? Because I will object. I said that has well, no relevance. Well, the, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, but the uh, the, the you, don't, don't you agree, you have don't, you agree the, don't you agree that the laws of supply and demand also apply to labor? I told you last week. Perhaps you forgot. There's a workforce of about 240 million people. This driven drab is some immigrants who are just trying to escape harsh conditions, and there's no nothing wrong. It is not illegal. I repeat, it is not illegal to want to provide 
for your own. That never is not illegal. But, Charlie, but are, don't you no different than my grandfather and someone in your family who entered the United States. And they're not here to harm us. There's a turnover on any given day. 10 million people change jobs or appointments. So, Charlie, are you, Charlie, are you ignoring, people. aren't you ignoring the law of supply and demand? When, yes. the, when the supply when comes out. To people, yes. Yes. Totally. Oh, you're saying supply and demand does not apply to people? The law of supply and demand is not about the price of labor. So you're thinking that all all these all these uh, illegal aliens that are here working for cash under the table, putting up plywood, you know, drywall, painting, landscaping. You don't think they're taking away jobs from union uh, construction workers? One of the reasons the unions were were criticized and rightfully so. Now, now Charlie, but answer my question. Minute, the employers will always try to distinguish, draw different groups. That's why they have scabs and they bring in scabs so that you have a different group. And they combat the two groups, combat the union. So that's what you want to encourage. These people join unions, become good members. As a matter of fact, one of them on my stewards, my immediate team of stewards uh, is of Hispanic origin. <clears throat> and she's doing good service for new other new employees. And they always will try to pivot one group against another. They used to do that with ethnic groups. We know that we know how it's done. So this racial group, white, black, <laughs> Well, they, we have Italians versus Polacks versus this and that. That's exactly what they want. Well, guess what? We're not going to go along with it. And I've so, marched many times for immigrant rights. What so, Charlie, I'm, Charlie, I'm, I'm a little confused. Why does our what union is... march for immigrant rights? I've marched many times. At immigrant rights events. Um, so, Charlie, I'm a little confused. Are we, are we goofy? What is, we're brilliant. We what don't, is a union we're kind of like, don't know the law of supply and demand. Charlie, would you shut up so I can ask? Are we having, is this a question and answer period? Sorry. I'm trying to answer, I'm trying to ask a question, and Charlie keeps running his mouth. All right, sorry. Okay, Charlie. So, like, here's, okay, so what I'm asking now is. No, or. What, what does the uh, union plumber or union carpenter do when now there, there's no work for them because that work is now being done by illegal aliens that are working for cash under the table? What are you going to tell these uh, union uh, uh, construction workers? There's, there's well, no why, work for them. Why, how do they how is it absorb by the illegals? What's that? Two different kinds of work alone. Repeat, repeat that one more time. There's only What's one question? kind of work, union work. What's the other kind of work? That the employer is breaking the law and you're saying <laughs> that's okay? And I well, it could be you're saying the employer, I mean, I, you know, I, I happen to know of, uh, I know of, uh, I know of people that own uh, buildings uh, that hire uh, you know, workers to come in and, and do things, and they don't check to see if they have a union card or if they're no, illegal no. or not. They just say, "Hey, I need this. I need this floor painted," and uh, and then here then here comes a, a whole crew of uh, who knows who comes in there painted. They're not union. They're all sorts you know, of, and, can I answer? Come on, go well, ahead. The balloons were were. The scabby to rat balloon was done by the construction boys. And they are the most active ones for identifying work being performed by non-union. They are the, the rat boys. I can tell you anytime I see a rat, 
most of the time it's construction guys and they have somebody who's trying to hire non-union people. And they're the ones that are out there. Now, if, if there were, as I said, penalties and fines enforced, they wouldn't have to do that. But Brian thinks the government shouldn't do that. Now, if you hire somebody illegally against the law, you work for a law firm. Are you saying they should be allowed to break the law because it saves them money? Well, I'm just saying that's, I'm just saying that's, that's the way it is, though. That's what people, you that's what's going on. You want, and that's why they go around putting up their rack. That's why they put up rats. Now, the other thing about construction is the law that I'm talking about, labor law, they got to, here's what they really need to solve it. That's a fancy term called common site is thickening, meaning if one trade goes out, all trades go out. All deliveries is a totally different activity. No <laughs> delivery in and out. You achieve that status, that condition, that bring an end to this right away. Now, Charlie, back to my other example. Now, let's say, for instance, these these uh, these these employee the the cheaper employees are they're all uh, they're all they're all they all got green cards now, and they're gonna they're gonna bid the job. The company that hire, hires them, they're gonna bid a job cheaper because they've got cheaper labor because these guys are willing to work for fifteen dollars an hour instead of the union guys. Don't don't these guys have the right to charge? Fifteen dollars an hour to get the work because to them, that's a that's a just wage, and uh, and they don't want they know they don't want to bid bid the job out at a higher wage wage because they want the very work simple, they don't want to be very side if, if you hire a, a company to work for you that does so illegally, then you are culpable. Just well, I'm much. talking about this is now illegal. Everything's about because you're not illegal. Illegal. You're an equal criminal to the crime. You know that. You're a party to the crime. Doesn't well, mean you're not. It's a person. Everybody's, everybody's legal now. In my new example, is my new example, crime. they're all legal. Don't you know that? Charlie. A dodge. You think you can eliminate being not being guilty of a crime? So you I, do it once. What do you think? It's like a drug lord? Drug lord in my new example, drugs. my new example, everybody's legal, they, but they're all they, they they're willing to work for fifteen dollars an hour instead That's of thirty dollars. Against the law. What do you mean it's against the law. It's against the union contract. Is is like law. No, there's there is no union. No, no, this there's one one company's union, one company's non-union, and they put in bids for a job. You're telling me. We should authorize people to break the law. I don't understand this. Is the law. This is crazy. I mean, if I'm a if I'm a if I'm a businessman and I'm gonna hire you somebody break the law. Yeah, it's the consequences. There's a I'm a businessman. I'm gonna hire somebody to paint my office and I get two bids, one's from a non-union company and one's from a union company. I go with the cheaper one that's non-union. That's not against the law. If they're not, if they're not a valid company, no, I'm not. It's a valid company. They have a license. You're, you're all, saying all you're not responsible. Get off it. This is silly. This is a dodge. You're we got Justin Tucker and we got Brian. Brian, do you mind if I let Justin go first and then we'll you, go? You don't. You you have to get firms license. No, no. Go ahead. Let, let Justin get a piece of that county first. All right. Hey, Justin. who's the speaker? Charlie it's was Charlie. the speaker tonight. Oh, Charlie was the speaker. Hey, Charlie. Um, if if uh if if a, if workers are on strike 
and and the management hires people to fill in uh fill in for those people on strike is it justified that those people who are breaking the picket line be subject to violence yeah yeah but i had two by four to the head are you serious yeah do it in but arrest them take them to an island slave yes are you, are, are you messing around with me or are you serious you know if you if you well, you're playing games with me phil now they're breaking the law it has to be enforced how is it how is it breaking the law who's gets who's it just because it's breaking the law i mean who gets hurt if you somebody breaks the, law, crosses the picket line arrested. simple huh if somebody breaks the law as i say there should be no strike or replacement law simple and if you break that law, you get arrested, and the owner gets fined for do, for everyone that he hires. What happens That's if the worker doesn't pay the fine, or the law. person who the it's scabs? It's part of the pro-choice act. Pro, it's it, it's pro-choice to want to smash somebody in the face for breaking. The yeah, they're they're putting themselves they're, uh, uh, in terms of ethics. They're not ethical. I accidentally muted. I accidentally muted you, Justin. My apologies, please. They're, no they're problem. not ethical. They're putting themselves, their own self. I don't like people who are unethical. Do you? So, so it's okay to take. It's okay to it's inflict okay violence to on people. Unethical. No, it's not okay to be unethical. Isn't it unethical to want to to violently assault people? You 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 are you're trying to to allow some oh. people to do something that's unethical. That doesn't work, Justin. So it's okay oh. to assault them. It's, it's it okay to okay assault to, people. It is not okay. Face the penalty. Oh. So if I assault you, it. if I take a wood board and hit you in the face with it, it's okay. If I do that because I say you're unethical. You 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 want to peg the unions as violent? So go ahead. Does that make? I didn't happy? peg the unions as violent. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm being very very specific. Violent. That's the only argument you got is to try to say that somebody is this. Now, I, if you want to have a logical discussion, the- We're having a logical discussion now, now, Charlie. I'm trying to understand why it's morally justified to assault people. You, 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 uh, listen, don't be silly. If you hire somebody- No, you listen. My taxpayers law, pay for your fucking uh, retirement, Tommy. Why, 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 should my, why should I fund your retirement? Because you're, 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 you get paid to stand around there's and talk about how it's him. violence is okay against strike tax. breakers. He's talking about my retirement. Personal yeah. attack. Fuck your retirement. Personal You, you think it's okay to go assault people? Tim, you, you think it's okay to, to hit, you know, that's not, Tim, uh, that's chair. not a, um, okay. Justin, let's uh, let's move on here real quick. Okay, Brian, go ahead. I win. Too bad. Go ahead, bro, Justin, and blast away. Come back later. So, you know, I think there's some pretty good union documentaries on uh, Amazon, Amazon Prime, Casino, The Godfather, um, Irishman. You know, there's some, some good union documentaries on, uh, available on Amazon. Uh, you know, you can rent it for four ninety nine. <laughs> there's that one three hour documentary called The Irishman uh, that's really good. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm just saying, like, in 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 regulating employers and companies and wages, where do where does your personal action come in i mean aside from just clamoring to the government who you know like recently the the railroad was not allowed the workers weren't allowed to strike they said it would be an unfair labor practice something to do with with messing around with their time off like the railroad did something the union said it was a you know i don't know, some some distinction that they make some legal so basically the court and the government is stepping in saying you cannot strike even though we're, we're, you're, you're so it, you know they've given up their right to strike in exchange for government interference and the government interference in this case wound up reducing their um personal time off so i i mean aside from all that and crying to the government trying to change all the laws and you know lobbying and 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 making money off the taxpayers which is what you kind of do um you know like where does your personal 
responsibility to regulate employers. Like, don't buy these products. Are you, are we back to this? Okay. Now you've tried this once already. Now, let me tell you, the railroads are not, the railroads operate differently legally under labor law mm -hmm. because they had their own legislation. Right. The Railroad Reform they, they turned over their, their, their right to strike to the government in exchange for certain protections. I don't and know. Now the government know. regulates whether or not they can strike because it's a national industry know. necessary for Let war. Can I answer? Is it my turn? Sure. I don't know what the trade off was. They thought it was good at, so if they do, as a matter of fact, I personally don't believe that if you, as you can find a method, and I assure you, I deal with mediators. And it's my own experience is that you often come away with much, much better through mediation than you do through these, or I'll call them adverse actions. Now that's Charlie Paydock yeah. and decades of experience. But, but here's, but here's the thing, Charlie, skillful, it's the government that sets skillful. the terms Wait of that minute. mediation. You it got a guy premise. like me, you got a guy like me going in there and negotiating a deal. And I must say that I usually come away with. Yeah, based, based on a premise established by the government. Right? So the gov government sets up these, like these me, conditions in which you can negotiate, and then you negotiate you can, you based on the framework that the government has established. You but I'm talking about individual action, you know, maybe group action, what like, like of all these things you would talk about with your commie government, always got to save everybody. I mean, where's you? I mean, you're, you know, like, uh -huh. the, like not buying something, boycotts. Uh, I mean, exactly. you know, if it's about worker fairness, don't buy from companies that don't treat their workers fairly. I, I, I'm going to give this again. Set up a framework for doing, engaging in economic and in, in the economy. Write this down, and you have rules. Mm -hmm. It's like you. you How many rules game. do we need, Charlie? You have a game, <laughs> right? When you were a kid, you had rules. Yeah. Yeah, how many? Said, Let's play how game, many? Right? 10 million? Board, do we, do we need 10 million laws, yes. Charlie? No, I'm saying, think about this. Close your eyes and say, uh -huh. hey, let's have rules. Okay, all right. Let's, let's, have, let's have 10 million, 150,000 you, you want to come along and say, the only way to play the game is to quit the game or something? I... To, I don't understand. No, why I believe in establishing a set of rules that everyone is capable of understanding. Flight, but when you have a set of rules, flight, like a certain set of rules for the, the railroad and a certain set of rules, rules for tradesmen or plumbers, it's like this, this vast regulation that you've established. And, and, and different industries have different rights as established by the government. Like, like in exchange for unionizing or, or, or for this protection kids, of the government, as you call it, people rules. have given up their right to strike. Kids can follow rules. They play board games. It's not complex. What about your right you to strike you that you've given up it. to the government? If you don't want to do it, like Bob's employers, mm -hmm. well, yeah, they're going to have to be penalized. Or disciplined. So, so if, if people it, are prohibited from striking and they still go to work, or they, or they, or they strike anyway, what happens to them? Does Listen, the government put them in cages? Sign. Find them. I got a big sign that I put up at places of employment, and it says these are the friggin' rules. Okay, so right so there. if a person if a person isn't authorized these to strike, are the, rules. the court didn't authorize it, and they go on strike anyway, what happens to them? I'm sorry, what do you, what is the question? If, if, if the court says you are not authorized to strike and the workers go on strike anyway, what happens to if them? The employer can file a charge against the union. And in fact, they do many times. And what do you mean a charge, a criminal charge? Unfair labor practice charge. Is, is, that, a, is that a crime or a civil penalty? Well, I don't know whatever you want to call it. Well, so is someone getting was, fined? Like at teacher, that point, then at that point, then the government's like, taking people's you money. Me, you want to learn or not? Um, I'm, I'm asking what, you. I mean, all right. Like, do they have levy fines? Will you be quiet? One of the features of the Taft-Hartley Act was that 
there you could file the employer could file charges against the union. So that is the that is what you have to do. Oh, okay, and, and okay, so they file charges. Then what happens? The court says you were you you could not strike, and you did anyway. And now we're going to fine you, put you in a cage. All I mean, so where does the where does happen. all kinds of things could happen after? Like what? That. Like what? That's what all I'm asking. All the way up you. to court could end up in the Supreme Court. Oh, and, but 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 then what? I, I mean, the fines, jail, what? They could huh? Same thing I mean, I'm asking you. So a, someone, so the powers, court says you know, no, powers, and they do the it anyway. What judge, happens? To them? The powers of a judge, injunction. You're a so lawyer. They, <clears throat> you're, you're asking me questions about how laws are enforced. Come on. So, so fines <laughs> and cages. Didn't they cover that in law school? So fines and cages. Or I don't. I, I don't study this class? aspect of the law. I'm no expert. I'm asking you. You missed that class on how the laws of the United States are enforced. So fines and cages. You know. So if you go on strike, you will be fined and put in a cage. You no, know, it's all prescribed on the penalty. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it sounds a like a pretty crappy guide. deal. Well, don't break the law. I mean, it's just you know giving people's rights away. If you don't have any right to strike, the unions no, they have to face penalties. If mm -hmm. they violate the law, it has the same mm -hmm. as employers. Right, but it why just so matter, happens to favor employers. Why, why do you feel I've had charges filed against me personally by employers? Did you know were that? They, were they going to put you in a cage? Well, it was thrown out because everybody knows I'm a very law-abiding citizen. The charges were dismissed. But... Oh, 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 good for you, Charlie. Glad they, oh, didn't, no. glad they didn't put you in a cage. Did I they take your stuff? <laughs> but, I don't yeah, want to, Brian, it's, 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 it's kind of getting a little bit crazy here. I'm going to let yeah, Justin. Yeah, and by the way, well, let me summarize this way. All right, Unions Charlie. You cannot do whatever they want. If that's what you're saying, no. There's very stringent rules, all kinds of rules. And where you can go, what you can do, uh, what you can say, uh, having strikes, boycotts, all kinds of mischievous activities. And some of them, if sustained, have attendant penalties. It can lead all the way to decertification. Uh, yes, it's a serious business. And yeah, the conduct of, is monitored by a third party called the government. You can assess if, in fact, you committed a violation. I got no problem with that. I always have follow the rules. Everybody knows me knows that I'm a law-abiding guy. All right, who's next? Okay, uh, Justin. Justin is Tucker. Here. Oh, here he's back. All right, well, Justin's been here for a while, so go ahead, Justin. Lower Hello, your Charlie. Hand. Let's let's try to keep. If you're it okay safe. with using violence against um, people who are peacefully seeking jobs, um, does that mean that it's okay that I can assault them preemptively in self-defense? You know, if you're trying to justify somebody crossing a picket line, I I'm not. You're not going to succeed. They're I'm trying to see them. how you justify the violence. Justin, it seems like it's you talk about ethics. Justin, Justin, you're talking about ethics, but you're you're advocating for Justin, violent behavior. That doesn't do seem very ethical. I, I do not put my needs above anyone else above anyone else's. Bullshit, dude. Of course you do. You're a human being. But your libertarians do. Bull, you do it too. All right, are you know, are you how many how many homeless people you got living in your in your home, Charlie? You know, as a matter of fact, on occasion, I have taken in several deadbeats. My sister calls them; she throws them out. So, uh, so, I got a so call who are today. these people that you put before you? I got a call today. As a matter of fact, I'm not making that up. You got a place I can stay? Well, are you going to let him stay, Charlie? 
but you shouldn't, you have to look at the situation. If you feel your needs for a job is superior to the needs of somebody else, then you, you decided, you know, I don't know how, but automatically your needs exceed the needs of anyone else in the world. And the world only exists for one foot in front of, one foot in front of and behind some people. Yeah. How does, uh, how does, how does violence um, uh, against people who, who cross the picket line, uh, what does that have to do with being, you know, selfless and helping other people? It sounds like yeah. it hurts people. And it sounds yeah. like it makes the union members look like thugs. Let me ask you this. Is it, they used to take a wooden shoe in Europe if the employer didn't pay good wages and throw a wooden shoe in the machine. Would you be opposed to that? If it was my property and they destroyed it, is That's it okay if I come over to your house and, and, and uh, you know, trash your place and break your shit? That's why they call it, it's wooden shoes called a sabbat, sabotage. Do you think sabotage? Yeah, if I come over to your place and start destroying your property, are you going to be, are you going to, are you going to be okay with it? So a, 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 a an employer that mistreats Yes people, or no, Kami? An employer Is it okay that, if I come over and trash your place and sabotage it? Well, I'm not mistreating people. Yes, you are. Oh. Well, yes, you are. You're advocating for for violence against strike breakers. You are you are exposing yourself to be psychotic and violent, and you make union people look horrible. I, you're I you're being you're making. I I'm gonna. I'm glad this is recorded. I'm gonna go to your union guy and tell him how uh how you're promoting violence. You think he'll so. like that? And, and tell them that anybody who puts their needs above the community is wrong you don't put your above needs above the community so why do you give a shit an what other people do an individual sees a crowd of strikers and he says i'm way more important than all of you and you like when him. did he say that and when did i why and is he crosses the picket line he's saying i am more important than all of you together no. Oh, I think what he's saying is there's a job here. I want to work and get paid for this job. So I'm yeah, going to do he's, it. He's, he's, he's harming that community. How is he harming? He's wor How is he harming? Where's the harm? You're, you're, you're advocating for, for violence against this person, yet you say that him doing that is harm. You have a really sick uh, and um, distorted view oh. of ethics. And no wonder why um, communism isn't taken so seriously. And no wonder why Charlie Paydock. Uh, okay. I don't know. Justin. Charlie Paydock is 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 a tyrant. If Charlie uh, Paydock would be uh, Charlie Paydock would be awful if he were given political power because he would be like Stalin times ten. All right, all right, Justin. Let's. Uh, I appreciate Stalin times ten. All right. Man, wow. Do you see any role for the company in an economic system? I told you that again. If a company wants to operate within the law, that's okay with me. But what are the laws? What are the rules? Are they fair? I think are most they lopsided are. like they are now. I don't want to. I'm not going to say okay. Let's let's go. Let's go to work, everyone. When I end up doing all the work. And wow. yeah, and getting no money for it. That's what you want. You want no, me Charlie, to do all the work. That's not what I want. And you guys want to keep all the all this stuff for yourselves. <laughs> well, somebody comes along and says, hey, I don't think this is right. This doesn't seem right. How come the boss keeps all the money and doesn't do anything? The boss was the one who started the business. In Florida. Oh, yes. They are always going to have a reason for advantage. I did this and I did that and everyone else is lazy and stupid, right? Okay, uh, well, I don't think so. Bob, go ahead, let's- uh, like, I, 
what attributes does the employer have that I'm lacking? Simple. He's provided capital to provide jobs. Oh, so he doesn't. Where do you get capital? We don't go into that range. The capital from investors. Does it, does it come out of the sky? Violating it. <laughs> you get investors. Hey, Charlie, there's these things called investing. banks. People put their money in there, and then people, the banks will then loan that money out to people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, that, getting loans is a pretty right, common just, occurrence. They let's, keep sixty percent of the wealth produced is the capital that they put in the bank, and they give you the other forty percent. They keep sixty, and put it in the bank, and start more companies, so they can put another sixty percent of the profits in the bank, uh, their bank account, not yours, not mine. Okay, their bank account. All right, Bob, you got some questions. Go ahead and unmute and ask away, please. Yeah, Charlie, uh, on uh, Biden's first day in office, he signed uh, Executive Order 13985, the, uh, the Advancing Racial Equity and uh, Support for under, Underserved Communities. Uh, uh, or um, do you want to? Tell us a little bit about that. And uh, I guess I, I believe that applies just to uh, uh, federal agencies. But uh, do you see a point at which uh, now this new buzzword equity that's entered into the vernacular uh, that becomes law? Like if, uh, let's say, for instance, if 13.5% uh, uh, of, uh, of the population is black, then 13.5% then of all uh, airline pilots have to be black and 13 and a half percent of all heart surgeons have to be black, et cetera. Is that, uh, what's your, what's your standing on that? Well, you got a two part question. I'm sorry. I'm not up on all the executive orders, so I can't answer, say anything about that one there. There's all kinds of those. Well, that well, that executive order uh, says that federal agencies have to report on how their hiring practices might uh, cause uh, in ra uh, racial or minority injustices, and then how how are they going to how are they going to address those those problems? So that's that, basically that's not new. That's not new. To, that's not new. Uh, but, what, on but what this is what this is moving towards is uh, this this all this equity business. Uh, so okay. do you could do I you, answer? Yeah, do you, yeah, go ahead. Again, listen, not new. There's been all sorts of things uh, reporting on how many disabled people you have, minorities, women. This, where have you been? So you're saying that the government then should hold a club over <clears throat> people's heads because and then and then like as you're, if you're an employer, you got to have a certain percentage of your workforce has to be transgender and a certain percent has to be gay and a certain percent has to be black and a certain percent has to be white and blah blah blah. Is that you're okay no. with? That? I don't, I'm not aware of any prescribed standards. And I have never seen that. But you do have to show that you made an effort to recruit. Yeah, there, are you denying that people were excluded, not excluded from the workforce? Well, Over the years, <clears throat> they most certainly were. Now, well, but were, were they excluded because of that? Wait a minute, through no fault of their own, they were excluded. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily, they were. Uh, I assure you, they were. Well, and there's- we have to have a remedy. You don't want to remedy it? You don't want to have a fair and equitable society? Well, so- well, wait, wait, wait a minute, the contracts I write- So fair and equitable, there's your, there's your keyword, equitable. So that, that means that, uh, let's say if you're Google or Apple or Facebook, that, you know, uh, you, you, that means that, you know, does 13, you need 13 and a half percent of your programmers have to be black. Otherwise you're not, uh, you know, you're, you're racist. Is that How what many you times do I got to tell you 
I've never seen any such standards. Now the contracts begin all employees. Well, that's what well that's what equity means. Finish, what do you think equity means? All employees in employment in basis will be treated fairly and equitably. And you look over the employment process. If someone feels that they were not treated fairly and equitably, do you someone have feels feels wait a minute how they feel okay. that provision for them to issue a complaint? and to have it resolved, reviewed objectively. That's a process that works. Now the burden of proof is on the person issuing the complaint. Now in all such EEO cases, they're difficult to prove because they don't put together a case. And very often it may surprise you, there is no finding of discrimination. It doesn't mean there's no discrimination. It's a, this is a real world, pal. Employers are real smart. And they tell all sorts of people, their own, they train their managers to not do certain things, which will get them in trouble. So for example, if you interview somebody, don't write anything down. After they leave, you can write all you want. But the person will say, well, did you keep any records when you met with Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so? They'll say no. So I know how the world operates, the real world. Okay. Who else has a question for Charlie? They all gave up. They're, they're all. No, I don't think they gave up, Charlie. I just think. They're trying to attack me. Oh, you're all this and that. No, Charlie, I just think you don't understand the fundamentals of business. Oh, yes, I do. And That's to get your, to give your, get of a job to the fair haired boy, your son. <laughs> well, Charlie, you know, it's. Uh, an income group. All right. Your brother in law. Are we a uh, are... job? Are we ready to move on to rebuttals tonight, or do you guys, anybody else, have anything to say? You guys throwing in the towel. No, I don't think they're throwing in the towel, Charlie. All right, I'm going to give, since we got some time tonight, I'm going to go maybe 10 minutes per rebuttals. Who's got a rebuttal tonight? Oh, man. Well, it's only 7.51. So so I, I have a question for Charlie. No, no, I think, yes, I think we should have questions for a little more. Like, well, All yeah. right, then we can do that. Fine. Brian, go ahead. Brian, go ahead. So was, was there something specific in your life where you thought the, the communist philosophy and communist party, Stalin, like really appealed to you? Like, is there there's some specific point? I, I'll be quite, uh, Brian, uh, as a young man, a freshman in college, I took a course in political science. And I read the Communist Manifesto, and I said, "This is, this is, uh, this this is a good document. This is, well, this this describes the situation. I even have portions of it memorized." Yeah. I said, "Wow, this is very accurate." Uh, and from then on, yes, I have no aversion to socialism or communism what have you, have they done everything perfect? No, by no means, but I think they're making an effort uh, regarding, I think a lot of people associate communism with these goddamn Bolsheviks in Russia, and I'll call them that, the bad guys. Bolsheviks are bad guys, and Justin doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand that yeah, that unfortunately, these Bolsheviks got in charge, and they're not like Putin. They're not. They're not nice people. The Bolsheviks and, always wind up in, in charge. Now, Charlie. Okay, I mean, that's the doing, history shows. The Bolsheviks always wind up in charge. What? No, there's nothing like a Bolshevik. Uh. -uh. You name that's me not, one country in the world that hasn't gone through some reign of reign of terror there isn't one about? because eventually 
you know, it, when, when the economy starts to fall apart and people aren't as prosperous, they're concerned, you know, tyranny devolves. And, and it's, you know, you it's like philosophies of, like I'm yours. Sorry, I've been studying history all my life and I have no idea what you're talking about. There is no, there is no nation that has survived the test of time. All countries, that all countries go through a phase of tyranny. Every, 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 like segment of the world, every the single world country in the world went through it. You have such a dark perspective. That's a reality. Happened here. <laughs> in your world, not mine, not in the history of the world that I've read. All sorts of peaceful communities have existed. It was the Lithuania never had anything like that. Yeah, till they got, till they got wiped out. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the history is a, it's a rough place, where's, man. Where's the, where's the period of tyranny? Bad guys get in charge of countries. Come on. It happens That's all what time. happens. It, Bad guys like the Bolsheviks. I just told you. That's what you got to watch out for. But it's not. No, it, it's this, Charlie, that to be a good politician, you have to be indifferent to the suffering of individuals. Because what? you have to, do you have to believe the, the that what? your policies may hurt a few individuals, but it's for the greater good, right? So in order to be a politician, you almost have to be a psychopath, and, and this the smiling and lying and deceiving. I mean, who do you think you know is gonna gonna gravitate to that um, that's, work? That's I mean, so, sociopaths, psychopaths. Those are the people that are gonna gravitate to being politicians. That's why you never trust them with power. People who are indifferent to the poor are indifferent to everybody. Not just the poor. <laughs> Come on, there are plenty of good people serving in public office who have their heads in their hearts. Sure, and, and, there's a, and there's a whole lot of evil people too because evil well, people are attracted to that. I know, you know, the ones I deal with, are, there's some good people. There's yeah. lots of good people in the government. I'm not saying that, but I'm also saying that, that not out to those people who anybody. are are very clever and very witty and very charismatic and who are absolutely sociopathic, they, they have, also they, gravitate to government. You guys have to have a real <laughs> negative world, you libertarians. I don't know the world. I want. I don't live in that world. I want to live in a peaceful world. I want to live in a, in a world in which no there problem. there are fewer reasons for police to come and kick down people's it's, doors and throw them in cages or a, shoot them a, and it's like even in your scenario you know going on strike involves using government force to you know coerce every people libertarian, through, through the, the threat of force i mean does every libertarian have three locks on their doors or something no we're individuals we have, we have all kinds of things door. people have different levels of security They're the evil with. ones will get you is that what you were raised to? The evil ones are coming for you. What kind of political philosophy is that? Your your evil entire ones, political philosophy is based on this theory that, ones are that private corporations control government and use government to serve their own interests. And in turn, to deal with that, you want to empower government. I, I mean, Charlie, like it's almost schizophrenic. What's schizophrenic? Only Trump is the only guy who got up there as a candidate for office, said there are evil people in this nation. Yeah, there are, and a lot of them and are people. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> there are evil people. And it's, like, and it's like, oh, there's all these evil people in politics. Give them more money and, and more cheered. power. They're going to fix it this them. time. This time they mean it. They mean well, sure. Okay, Charlie. I, I that, mean, that's, that, the, that's the, that's it. Keep those locks on your doors. The evil ones are coming for you. The, the corporations are going to take everything, Charlie. Empower the government owned by the corporations to deal with them. You know, there can be economic leveraging. That's not evil. Take from the rich, give to the poor. It's ethical. Charlie, what you don't understand is that the free market is people just buying and selling things, innovating. Some people want to work more. Some people have different talents. Everybody throws their talents out into this marketplace and tries to sell what they have to earn money and to earn capital why, why to do, live. Right? Why, I mean, why that's, have to make 
Why do I you know, have to but what your every government intervention minute, minute, is minute. the threat of force. Minute, somebody, and it's like you just want this threat somebody, of force covering everything, you know. It's like if you violate this rule or that rule or this rule, there's a million rules and you better follow them out. Our government's gonna stick the jackboot on you. I mean, it's like Charlie, you just want that over everything. It's just I, I and maybe that's just a perception and not, not in order truth. to sell a gadget, you gotta have somebody you make it. That's that's where you innovation and motivation comes you, in, Charlie. You, not you, government. Uh, you, have a way, you have a way of making goods produce out of the air. Yeah. Oh, all right. So I know how to produce goods. I'll get together yeah. with all my friends. You, I'll, you I'll, I'll form a child, lobby, a coalition, and then I'll elect somebody, anything. and then I'll raise taxes, and then I'll create a bureaucracy, and then I'll create that thing. Why don't you find the child in Asia to make your gadgets? Charlie, who opened trade with them? I mean, come on, give me a break. I mean, it's like the stuff is made over there. Well, you know, that that quarter an hour, that probably feeds their family. Like you want to dump on it. But you know what? That's a, that that that's keeping people alive in a place that maybe they might not have other otherwise have access to those kind of maybe they'd starve. You I know, but yeah, you got better ideas. You know, you know I, what I look get at your a friends factory. together, lobby government, raise taxes, create a bureaucracy, and and maybe then they'll deal with it. But they're probably gonna need some more money first. And, and some Look more law a factory and a police force and one guy and a pension sitting there, <laughs> sitting, one guy is sitting there motionless and then he looks out of the window and there's hundreds of people making gadgets that he can sell he said and he tells you i i have some attributes that put me in this position i'm entitled to be here and you say Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Charlie, if you're talking about, you know, issues with inherited wealth, vast estates belonging to ultra rich people who could never spend all that stuff in a hundred generations, I hear you. But when we talk about the free market, it's generally, I mean, just people buying and selling and trading and innovation and, and, and things like that. I mean, the government interferes. The government sets the rules through the threat of force to when you when you violate what some rule that they've come up with. I mean, otherwise, the free market is just people doing stuff, you know. Oh, and, like and that's the part that you miss, like, like making dangerous items, making all kinds of stuff. Charlie, you know what? The, the automobile was pretty dangerous when it was created. And yeah, and I, I over time they, as as people as technology and, and people I, learn. I, I mean, said, it, it's like you want to, you want to, you know, it's like gov because government created speed limits. Is that right? That's why the roads, that's why there's Why, speed why do right. they have, I, are you opposed to the Consumer Product Safety Commission? Yes. You are? Yes. So you think people could willingly? That, sound, that sounds like a bunch of people sitting around collecting a pension and a fat paycheck to make up a bunch of rules that nobody knows but them. Right. But as soon as you violate it, they're going to want to let you know, because they got a guy just like you that's going to come in and say, hey, you know what? You know, you did that. That's a clear violation of the Wait a minute. If I, if, I manufacture, <laughs> if I manufacture a product that explodes and harms people, that's OK with you? The, the market provides, Charlie, when when things like that happen, people adjust their buying habits, their consumption oh. habits. Companies adjust their products. Well, I mean, there's airbags and seatbelts because because of innovation, not government. So if you, you have something, a device that explodes in your house, I'll tell you, I think you ought to adjust your buying habits. Well, the thing is, there is also the power of the lawsuit. Uh, can be filed he, against him, just adjust your buying habits. But no. the, the lawsuit, if, if it's if it's based purely on common law, right, then yeah. then it's one person asserting their rights against the, against another and the and the court's there to, to make a decision and intervene, so right? And, and the parties yeah. request that, right? So if a so, coffee pot explodes, you'll tell me, Charles, I think you should adjust your buying habits. Surely the first thing is is that the <laughs> this is the economy. This is and you're economist. I'm not an economist. I'm an, I'm a lawyer and an accountant. I'm not an economist. <laughs> like I know how to count and read. You guys, <laughs> I love you guys. These guys are so, one is loonier than the next. I'm right. sorry, that's the first of all. Look, I'm not I'm not saying a free for all, Charlie. I'm just saying it. You know, I mean, there are so many rules. They're innumerable. No one can know them all. Oh. 
And, and it's like, you know, you sit there and cry for more rules and more rigorous enforcement of the rules. And, and rather than looking to kind of decrease the number of rules, you know, increase increase the freedom that people have to do things. Listen, listen, I was a federal bureaucrat and I dealt every day. Sounds like it. The term is law, rule, or regulation. And guess oh, yeah. what? There's about a million federal employees and they're all able to function every day without within the doing the law, rule, or regulation. It's not hard. It's not hard. It, yeah, let's it, like we should fire those guys. I, I don't want to pay their salaries and their pensions. Whatever they're doing, it's probably, probably not worthwhile. <laughs> it's not hard to do. Just like the kids with the game. Fired. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. No more pensions. Buddy. Hey, can I ask a question now? Certainly. Hey, Charlie. So when you had uh, when you had what you called them deadbeats, which doesn't sound sound like a very charitable name for homeless people, did, when they were staying with you, did you allow them to form a tenants committee to help govern life in the uh, in the in the house that uh, they were staying at? I, I, well, there's only one at a time. I... I'm not well, did you, okay. Well, if it was one at a time, were they able to? Uh, was Did they have a cool shelter. say in how the in how things were operated? And hey, not just and I just helped the guy out. Some guys out on occasion. It's not that big a deal. I'm sorry. I yeah, but you. I mean, everybody's got a right to a, a a place to stay, and everybody should have a right to um, make questions. decisions about where they stay. So when when you're bringing these people in, are you are you empowering them? And letting I, I them and giving putting them on equal footing with you as co uh, co tenant of that space. I never gave them a list of rules. If that's what you're asking, or that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if you let them I make decisions. Said, I never Were they on equal footing with you? Rules. Huh? So why would they? Since right. I didn't, I wasn't authoritarian. That's not what I'm asking. Yes or no? Did these people have equal? Did, did these did these I people stay at your you, place or did they if stay they at didn't have any rules, our place? If they didn't have any rules, I think that's an equal footing. I didn't know you were thinking, see, that's what I mean. You guys are so narrow scope that you think automatically the whole world immediately writes some rules. All <laughs> right. Well, Charlie, you had, uh, you had, Come on. You know, your favorite I'm part just, in uh, Dr. Shivago is the part where where they expropriate his house. So yeah, I'm just trying cool. to see um, if you want those same sort of, uh, you know, things uh, applied to your house. You ought to explain that story. The, he went home, uh, Chivaga went home. Uh, they had the revolution and he finally made his They stole his house. To the family mansion. And, he ended, and it, it was stolen and, from him. And they said, this is, oh, by the way, this is now People's Housing Unit 9. And there are, I mean, what, 34 families living here. Now, the question is, that seemed to escape you. Why did that one family have a home and those 34 families didn't? Didn't that occur to you to ever ask that? No, my question has to do with what you do. My question is, how come you want to be the, uh, why do you want to be a tyrant? Um, but you don't, uh, you don't, you know, people should, if people can uh, live in a house and have a committee and have a tenants committee and help run that house, I don't I, see uh, well, why you don't allow that to happen within your own place. How was I a tyrant? Please give me evidence. Of huh? my Justin, Justin, let's, uh, I think. How I, was I a tyrant? No, it's, uh, if, 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 Benny and, and Charlie can go back for 10 minutes. I'm going to go back uh, and forth. Okay, uh, ahead, why do I act like a tyrant? You, you, you think it's okay for strikers to assault people. Here we go again. I mean, you, you have a really warped sense of morality if you think that assaulting peaceful people is okay. Well, it, if people get punished for doing wrong things, are you saying hitting people, people uh, hitting people, people assault escape. is wrong? So you pe people should escape punishment for what wrongdoing. Punishment? 
and it escape punishment. Crossing a picket line does not is not a crime. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's called one trial learning. You sound Only like a God psycho, dude. That. You're a Only psycho. The fact, the fact that you're 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 joking around, you don't believe this stuff, but the fact that you're like going along with it makes you look like a psychopath. Oh, I don't think Charlie is probably one of the most professional people I've ever known. Well, is- I mean, he's professional, yet he's he's encouraging assault. That's not very professional. That's psychotic. I, I think he's incur I think he just hates scabs, that's all. Well, fine. He can hate scabs all he wants. Just because you hate somebody doesn't mean you get to assault them. Right. Psycho. What about, anyway, what is that guy, uh, psychopath. What is, scab, what is scab doing to the children of the strike breakers? Well, is Charlie. What, going on strike doesn't. What's going on strike doing for the children? You're not getting paid. He does. He puts his own needs above those of children. Yeah, is, I, yeah, you're you're a psycho, dude. You're justifying your psychotic, person. violent uh, morality by oh, saying God. that people who who straight yeah, who, Justin, uh, who are scabs Justin, are uh, are are down, okay. more selfish. So it's okay. I think you're selfish. If it's okay to assault selfish people, Charlie, then don't uh, be surprised when you get assaulted because you're a selfish old right. commie bastard. Justin, let's uh, let's getting into the personal attack range here. Let's try. No, to... this guy's this guy's well, this guy was okay with assault. That's not anything in goodwill. This guy is uh, encouraging violence against people. Why do I got to be nice? Why do I got to be nice for somebody who's encouraging Understood. violence? Understood. Okay, now let's. Uh, shall we? Justin, move Justin. In hey, the psycho. Of, psycho. In the... hey, psycho! Psycho! Hey, psycho! In the real world. Hey, psycho! Hey, psycho! Uh, Justin, the, please let's tone it down if you don't in mind. In the real world, in the real the, world, uh, you don't go around assaulting people, you psycho. In the real you know, world, in the, the real world, you don't go around assaulting people, psycho. I don't care what in the real world you live in. You don't live in the real world. You live, in a, you live in a fantasy world, psycho. This, you think that assault's point. okay? Earlier psycho. in my talk, I gave a thing an episode in which a whole phalanx. 50 police organized marched into a crowd of employees. And that situation was the one that is memorialized. And that took place in many locations, many, many locations. There's memorials like that all over the place. And don't tell me that union people are violent, Justin. That's not a real. No, I didn't say union people are violent. I'm saying real... you are violent. Hey, you, you are violent. You want to, you want to hurt people Justin, because quiet. you 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 don't like Justin. peace. You are anti peace. You Justin, think it's okay to assault people. That is psychotic Justin. behavior. Right, Justin. Justin, Justin, please Justin. let. Uh, we live in a society. We don't go around assaulting people. Justin. You think it's okay? So, uh, I mean, you know, who gives a fuck what you think? If you okay. think it's okay to go around assaulting people, let's move on to Brian up next. Any, you think it's okay to hurt people, so you know. What do those police do? All right, I'd like so, to move on to Brian now. He's got another question. So, in, in light of last week's presentation, wait, wait a you, minute. Let me finish this. One of the things that bothers me is that when I read a lot of labor history, and we never knew the names, we knew the names of the guys at Market, but there were all sorts of situations. I've read about in factories, large and small, lumber mills and whatever. And we'll never know the names of the people in coal mines, they had gun battles. And we'll never know their names. Whatever you're about to say doesn't justify violence. We'll never know their names. And they were not out to harm anybody. They just wanted fair and decent treatment, fair and equitable treatment. And to say that they're violent people is a discoloration that is and not Charlie. Possible. You're I didn't call them violent. I'm calling you violent. Don't pull this straw man shit on me, dude. I'm talking about you, psycho. You're not uh, allowed Justin, in the forum to let's, call me uh, anything. Okay, Charlie and Justin. I think we don't need All to right, go. Brian, to I let's, cut go off. let's go down like we we Brian been, is back. So All um, right, Brian. do you think that the Bigfoots should uh, unionize, and, and what kind of laws would do you think they would be subject to? I mean, the 
I don't know what kind of work they could do, but surely they'd want to unionize and get regulated well, by the government. What do you all think? Well, it's all answer to Bigfoot effect seeking the protection of the law. That's what the Bigfoot people, lefty people like me, seek for the leave them alone. They're an indigenous people. No, I don't think they're people. I think they're animals, they're apes. But they're species. Now, it's had a lot of people draw the line. They don't think animals have rights. Uh, you can argue that, um, probably with some justification. But we seek their protection to, from harm. That guy says, yeah, he says, I'm out to harm people. I'm, I'm trying I'm to gonna leave for them. about 30 even seconds. I'm going to take care of my cat. Even for, even for creatures in the jungle, the woods. I just leave them alone. Don't bother them. So don't unionize the the big Why do they? They don't have jobs. <laughs> they don't have factories. All mills, right. Thanks. Lumber mills don't hire them. <laughs> Anybody else should. got a question? It's only nothing, Bob. I think the hey, big Charlie foots would be, would be aptly suited for the lumber industry. I mean, if they were out there like gathering lumber, yeah. I mean, those they would be very effective. Um, oh, oh, so I'll tell and, you and, something. I'll tell you something right now. I am glad for capitalism. I've got a cat right now that is making a lot of noise. I'm glad they make these things. <laughs> <laughs> She's now happy and purring. That's what free market capitalism does, Charlie. Yeah. No, oh, that's what somebody that somebody wasn't paid enough money made. That's he, up to, made this, he made this to make money. And the thing is, is that he found a need in a marketplace for it. Yeah, and they put it in one of those envelopes that won't biodegrade. Well, Charlie's God, called packaging. The concern for the environment is commendable. <laughs> hey Charlie, is right. uh, are you do you believe in war is bad? Well, I'm a pacifist. You're a pacifist. Bullshit, you're a pacifist. You think it's okay to assault people, retard? I'm chairman of the and founding member of the War Resisters League Chicago chapter. How can you be anti-war but then pro uh, hitting people in the face with a board for crossing a picket line? Sounds like sounds like two contradictory uh, uh, positions being held there by you. Sounds like you have a lot of cognitive dissonance in uh, your head right now. And let's let's uh, please let's try not to go down this rabbit hole again. Let's call it situational ethics, Justin. I'll say. All right, situational uh, ethics. It's never okay to assault people unless you're doing it in self-defense. Well, that's called a categorical imperative. Categorical imperative is just a nice name of saying, is just a nice way of restating. jesus uh you know christian ethics so is union membership going up or down like i mean like the power of labor like where where would you put the power of labor like in in the context of historical america zero it's way down i didn't include that in the talk gene did it's it's very low that's not mean that doesn't mean the union people are in cape and qualified or that people don't want unions But it's a very, I've sat through so many programs and lectures and and union officials, hours on end, trying to understand this. A lot of it is just demographics. Those big, big industry centers closed down. Big steel mills are gone. Thousands of employees. Maybe if uh, the unions didn't uh, jack up the cost of labor, uh, the steel industry would still be here instead of not. Yeah, all kinds of reasons. It's closed down because of an of of their stuff. methodology. Yes, all kinds of trade laws are discussed. Uh, Bernie Sanders just had a piece of legislation last week trying to con- curb outsourcing. Yes, it's well known and discussed. Uh, Our labor costs, part of the reason for moving overseas? Sometimes yes, most of the time no. 
you'd be surprised. They, that's not the issue. All right. That's let's not the Who else has a question tonight? I know we've been going back and forth. Bob, you want to kick in anything, Vicki or Melanie? Uh, we've been going quite a bit here tonight. And well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of curious where uh, Charlie gets his demographic information about Democrats and Republicans and working class. Seems to me that the working class party is now the Republican Party and the Democratic Party is the, the ruling elite, you know, like all the, the rich, uh, you know, industry heads and, and uh, politicians and things like that and uh, performers and celebrities. And then at one end and at the other end, um, all the, uh, you know, basically uh, minorities, you know, poor people, uh, that, you know, are looking for handouts on the other end. Uh, isn't Charlie mistaken that uh, that the middle class has anything to do with, you know, Democrats anymore? I mean, we we moved. I'm I'm I consider myself working class, and I moved to the Republican Party. We're, you know, these are the, the that's where the people are that that drive the trucks, that harvest the grain, that had, you know herd the cattle, you know, the, the cut the meat and everything else. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the Democrats are <clears throat> people like John Kerry and Nancy Pelosi and Mark Zuckerberg, you know, at one end, then at the other end, then you've got, you know, uh, all the, uh, you know, people that are basically on the dole. All right. Bob, why don't you look up how the workforce has changed over the years? My unit, uh, my home unit of my union is entirely comprised of uh, uh, 600 professional employees, all of whom had advanced degrees. I've represented people such as the jet propulsion lab, things like that. So that'd now, be the rule. According to you, uh, Trump and so forth is attracting uh, wage grade employees, we call them, uh, employed in factories, uh, rural areas. To say that's the totality of the workforce. It is it, now there has been conspicuous actions to keep professionals out of organized. That's how they, you are no, you know, computers and you know quite well they're trying to contract employees stuff. So. Uh, and that's been an unfortunate situation that it ever began. They never are employees of the companies, they're just there a short period of time. If they cause any problems, what happened? Their contract's not renewed, right? And it can be terminated on the spot without appeal. Now that situation is replicated over and over and over. They're not eligible for union membership. Things like that take place. Uh, it's not the fault that, as I told you earlier during my speech, employers, have a favorable government on their side and they hire attorneys and they're willing to spend any amount of money uh, to postpone uh, unionization activities. And as long as that exists, the unions have to come up with an equitable part of money. Do you think our lawyers don't need a living? Don't you think our lawyers need to get paid? That's what I mean. Uh, like here, uh, like I was saying, the, the, the thing like business unions. I've been in negotiations where they had three lawyers, three company lawyers, and a per actually two lawyers and a personnel officer against me. That's what you're up against. Well, we don't um... have the resources. So when they say, well, they're business unions, it's a business environment that we're in. Not one we like. Sure, I'd like to have the shop steward resolve matters, but that, no, they don't allow that. 
you, you have that, you start disciplining an employee, you're dealing with a personnel officer or a lawyer. All right. Yeah, it's uh, not the manager, it's not the boss. They hire somebody, you know, to affect discipline. Okay. Are we uh, done with our questions now? Can we go to rebuttals or what? Yeah, these guys are licking their wounds, man. Okay, we're gonna go to we're gonna go to rebuttals. I'll uh I think I'll give everybody six minutes. You wanna s I know I know Bob you got a rebuttal in you. Brian, I know you got a rebuttal in you. Are you guys ready to go? Steve, how about you? You wanna do a rebuttal tonight? No? No, everything I might add has been added. Okay. Uh Brian, you wanna do a rebuttal tonight? Sure. All right, I'll put you down a second. Uh Bob, you're going to do a rebuttal tonight, I hope. Yeah, I'll do one. Okay, I'm going to put the, I'm going to go first. Uh, we're going to have Brian go second. And we're going to have you go third, Bob. Who else? Melanie, you want to add anything tonight or Vicki? Well, I'm, it's not really a rebuttal and I don't know the format, but I was a, a government nurse and a private sector nurse. And I was involved with two different unions through um, the government and also through private sector. And um, I, I found the government um, operating system very, very difficult, but far more responsive. Uh, there was much less incentive stuff towards the union. But I also ran into some uh, problems with uh, INA, uh, the design of the, the organization where it allowed for the money to disappear, the strike fund money. Okay. So that's all I have to say. It's not a rebuttal. So I said it already. <laughs> well, Melody, that, that, that's great. I mean, I'm glad you contributed. Um, Vicki or Charles or Dan, you guys want to say anything real quick before we get started on rebuttals? Um, Could I just say something about that strike fund money? Go ahead, Charlie. I, just, I get called in to deal with locals. And one of the common things are um, somebody's house burns down or they have a tragedy in the family and the union wants to help them out or they loan them money. And <clears throat> I have to come in and police the locals and say, no, that is not allowed. Union funds can only be spent for union expenditures. Now, I even went so far as to set up a charity so that we maintain a charity with a good amount of money. We have little fundraising events so that we don't use union dues. Now, yes, there are occasions, everybody has to report once a year on their finances. Uh, it's called an LM3 report. And my own local, I'm the secretary treasurer. And I assure you, I always get mine in and on time and have uh, all the records to back it up in the event they want to ask anything about it. Also, at any given time, headquarters of my union would show up. And this guy said, I'd like to see your books. And I said, all right. I got them in a banker box. And he'd look them over for a couple hours. And then he'd say, Charlie, let's go to lunch. It's on me. But yeah, and now another thing. I had a good friend in the union. Actually, she, she represented the employees at this missile base in New Mexico. Was it White Sands? And she didn't take a lot of money, but she took a lot of money over at a little bit at a time. And quite tragically, I was surprised at this because it's not that big a unit, but it's a good size. But she was put in the Hoosgal for five years. Yeah. So you can end up in some real serious trouble. That's the problem all. with the problem with the INA at the time was that they on the NGW commission, um, which is economic and general well, welfare, they didn't they didn't recruit people with good accounting skills, and uh, I was you know they had people that were frontline nurses, which is good, but we weren't able to 
I figured out that the, the, the guy that was handling the money was not putting it in the right fund. And I kept bringing it up that we need to put it in the right fund. It was like the uh, shell game, you know, where you move the cups around. So ultimately it turned out there were uh, $3 million uh, unaccounted for. And I was afraid of being personally prosecuted. Um, I managed to get um, that union out. You know, I mean, I wasn't the one, but you know, I publicized the structure of it and the fact they didn't have a financial firewall. Um, and so we, you know, what do you call it? Defranchised them. We, we stopped using them. Uh, and went, went with the NNU, which was better. But anyway, it's that's an internal thing about union structures and business. And I just think there's a problem with not having people that understand the business end. Obviously, you have a vaster level of experience than I did, certainly as a bedside nurse. It's, you know. it's next to impossible when you have a union election. The reason I'm secretary treasurer is because we couldn't find anybody who wanted to do it. And it's a hard position to fill in a local. That's why many locals, you get dues free that they have to resort. They will pay the dues of anybody to be the secretary treasurer because it yeah. entails real work. Yeah. And they will offer free dues. I mean, I raise my hand. I've had every single job in my union, top to bottom over again. What am I doing as secretary treasurer of a local? Okay, it's because you. we couldn't have an election without running. You can't have an election if that position is vacant. Okay, Vicki, you got a question, go ahead. Yeah, this isn't a rebuttal. I'm just very disturbed by the situation of colleges and universities in this country who appear to be only hiring part-time faculty. And so for doing the same work that professors do, the adjuncts have to have two, three, four jobs. They're driving all over the place. They get no benefits. Some are in unions, some aren't, but I don't know that the unions are doing much for them those that are in unions and I don't know what can be got, be done and I don't know why colleges claim to be so broke. Could I answer that? Yeah. Okay, I represent, I know two people very well, close friends. One guy represents the employees of colleges, custodians and cafeteria people and light bulb chain. No, that's a totally different world. Now, the other one is called, there's this group called the Coalition uh, 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 COCAL, C-O-C-A-L, Coalition of Contingent Academic Labor. And it began, it's an interesting story. It began right at the school I'm affiliated with, the University of Illinois, here in Chicago. And the guy's name was Joe Barry. He's since retired and moved to California. I keep in touch with him all the time because I was a member of Coquel. And we were working on the U of I itself, uh, Roosevelt uh, campaigns. And he even got wrote a book on it. And I send him articles if I come across um, he puts out a week monthly newsletter and I'm often a contributor, at least links. There's something going on right now at the University of Chicago. I don't know the details, but yeah, I'm totally aware. As I was talking about contract employees, that's what they are. If you give them any grief, you don't get the contract again. Mm -hmm. And it's a perfect employee from the employer's perspective. And that's what you're up against. It's difficult organizing. Mm -hmm. Now the graduate students as well, I was involved in that. And as a matter of fact, a young man who worked for me as a clerk later on in school got very active. I don't know why, maybe somebody influenced him, got involved in organizing graduate students. And he even was featured in an article in the New York Times. 
and I keep in touch with him once in a great while, not too much. But do you think he might have been influenced by somebody? <laughs> okay. Well, it's, thank you. Even, this was this was helpful. Yeah. Me all day. <laughs> Just all right. Uh, Let's move on. Talking about feeding up scabs. All right. If you guys are ready to move on to rebuttals, we'll go six minutes. We got me, we got Brian, and we got Bob. All right. All right. Uh, if you guys are ready to go, we'll let Charlie get the last word. You know, Charlie, tonight I am very, uh, I tend to understand that you're not exactly uh, know what the role of business and entrepreneurship is. And uh, I just want to make it really, really clear what the investment capital and the capitalistic system is and the voluntary uh, associations with it and why people go into business. The reason people go into business is to make money and they do it by finding a need in a marketplace and going it. They have to get investors. The role of entrepreneur is a very hard one to do. Now I'm going to go back into the archive. I've got a short three minute video here on why business works. I'm going to play it and then I'm going to comment on it afterwards. And uh, I'm going to just very quickly do this. And uh, I think we'll, we'll have quite a bit of a, uh, quite a bit of, um, uh, how shall we say, uh, quite a bit of, a, of, of, of summary on this thing. You guys might like this because it's something that we're probably with our age group, we're all familiar with. I'm gonna play it now and uh, we'll let it go with this real quick, okay? Somebody explain why the elves have not tried yet, but I want to stay in business. Can I do it? Business? Well, Wait, it's this way. A manufacturer who sticks to old equipment cannot compete and must fail. To survive, he must persuade people to risk savings in his business. He can then buy new equipment increase production and show a profit. And he keeps the profit. Oh, no. That's what a lot of people think. But he doesn't. Out of profit, he must pay dividends to investors. Profit must be put back into the business to buy newer and better machinery. He spend his profit on machinery? Oh, when does it all end? It never ends. Constant replacement with the latest machinery makes the industry more efficient, thus enabling it to pay higher wages and still make a profit. This efficient operation also results in more goods, of better quality, and produces them at a lower cost to everyone. By the thunder, if that's the way it's done, I'll do it. Cat, what? Now watch, Sylvester. Pay attention. Fifty years ago, the standard of living was low. People worked long hours for real pay. But because people's savings were used to back good ideas and industry proud back earnings, new products appeared. New and more efficient industries made more jobs and higher wages and shorter working hours to enjoy the higher standard of living. Hey, uh, that figures, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure does. So, without the use of savings for capital investment, there would be no new industries, no new jobs, no improvement in products, 
and no progress. So that's the part on business and investment. Biz a lot of times businesses have to profit. Hi, this is Terry Lupo. Uh, hang LCL on, hang on. I got to get this damn friend thing of mine off. sent this part. Anyway, that's why business works. It's not so much the profits that are made, but the investments in uh, new equipment, new machinery. And of course, you also have to pay for human capital. And that means employees. And a lot of times businesses in the long term, if they treat their employees right, they do prosper. And yes, the boss does make the money in businesses. And that's why the boss started the business in the first place. You need employees, you need, you need government. And yes, there are some bad actors out there. But the point of the matter is capitalism as a whole works. It brings us new goods, it brings us innovation. It brings us new, new things that we can always do to help us out. You've just seen it in the last 30 years, what innovation can do. Look at what Steve Jobs did. Look at what, uh, look, look at what uh, Bill Gates did in the building their empires of uh, software and the, and the personal computer. Look at what happened with the internet. Now, a lot of times, yes, there was some government investment initially involved in a lot of this stuff in order to uh, you know get going with the defense spending and things like that. But that's been the way we've been operating for years. A little bit of investment, either from the government or from the private sector. We then get those products out to the marketplace. People find more, more ways to uh, solve needs in the marketplace and even determine needs we haven't had. We have advertising now that helps us build the economy. And as we move on, goods do get cheaper. They get more mass produced. We have more wealth today on a per capita basis than I think we've ever had. Like I said, 300 years ago, everybody was a peasant. Now we're living in apartments. We're able to Zoom each other. And to me, globalization and capitalism and free trade have done just that. And if you can't see that, I think there must be something quite a little bit crazy about you. Now, I do acknowledge that you know, in some cases, you know, especially when some of these larger corporations get monopolistic, there is such a thing as called the antitrust laws that, that need to be happened sometimes. And yes, there are businesses that will take advantage of employees. But most of the time, you know, in most places, the workers are usually treated, you know, fairly in what the market can bear. We're seeing that for the first time in a long time because of the current labor shortage, Wages going up um, a little bit. Employers are having trouble finding workers for their jobs, and they're starting to come around a little bit more. Now, for a long time, we didn't have that. But, you know, again, we're going to see more innovation, more uh, things. And the future, for me, is actually quite bright if we just keep our free market principles running. That's the end of my rebuttal. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Okay, Brian, if you're ready, go yeah, ahead. I'm ready. So, the yeah, I mean, the, the free market is what provides all this stuff. It's innovation. I, you know, I, I won't dispute, though, even as a libertarian, the need for labor unions, because there is always a segment of the labor force that's easily replaceable, like their, their labor's are easy to learn, they're low skilled, so it's easy to replace one human with another, right? Because the, the skill set needed to learn that job is low. So people in that category of labor, of which there are many, um, they really, they have no bargaining power with their employer other than acting collectively. So, you know, my, my, I guess my criticism of, you know, government invention intervention with the labor unions is that there's not more unionization of the low-skilled laborers in America 
that there's not more threats of strikes that if people aren't treated fairly, that they're going to go on strike. Um, and, and, you know, I would, you know, certainly government has played a huge role in that because it regulates the industry to, and, their, and, and it regulates their ability to strike, you know, defines unfair labor practices and, and whatnot. So, you know, I, I mean, that, that's my issue is that the, you know, the government was invited in to regulate the, the relationship between you know, workers and their employers. And lo and behold, holy cow, government sided with the employers and the labor unions have consistently lost power. So, you know, that's my issue as a libertarian. I, I would remove these kinds of restrictions that, uh, you know, prevent labor unions from going on strike or organizing because I understand the that the collective bargaining power of those segments of the labor force that you know, need to act collectively to have a voice that's anybody's willing to listen to. So that's a thank you. Okay, Brian and Bob, if you got it, you're next. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, it's better to look uh, look at uh, this idea of labor uh, through uh, a libertarian lens. Um, for one thing, I mean, everybody should have the right to enter into an agreement, you know, voluntarily free of, uh, of coercion. And uh, if, hey, if somebody wants to, you know, paint my house for $15 an hour and another guy who says, I'll paint your house for $30 an hour. Well, if I think they, they can do an equal job or they do do an equal job, I'm going to hire the guy for, for 15 uh, that's, you know, that's entering into a voluntary agreement. I see nothing wrong with that. I see no reason why government needs to stick its nose in there. Now, if I had a company and the, if the union, uh, if, I mean, if the employees voted to form a union, uh, I think the company has a right to decide whether, uh, they will allow a union or not. And uh, they can refute, they should be able to refuse it and not have, you know, big government in there with a club over their head saying, oh, you have to, uh, ex you know, accept this, this, this union. Um, now, if I was an employer and my employees voted to form a union, there's a strong chance that I would maybe say, okay, fine, you know, uh, as long as everything's voluntary. I mean, in some respects, uh, you know, it might be it might be an okay thing, uh, you know, but again, this should be uh, something that, uh, you know, the, em the employer can voluntary, voluntarily uh, enter into an agreement with. And, and maybe he's not, maybe he doesn't want to do it. And I think that's, that's fine too. We'll take a quick note here just to bring this in up to modern times a little bit that, uh, that the largest auto uh, manufacturer, the largest employer, uh, Tesla, has 70,000 employees, and they're non-union, and uh, Elon Musk invited the, the UAW to, to hold a vote, and they did, and the, and the employees voted against joining the union. Uh, so so there, there you go. Uh, but again, I don't think that anybody should be uh, forced, you know, compelled by force of government to make any, uh, any, any rules, uh, you know, to, to have to, you know, have, uh, be forced to accept a union and that kind of thing, as well as all these, uh, these new, you know, this really scary thing here, all this, this diversity, inclusion, and equity that somehow got injected into our, uh, our lives uh, with with the Biden administration, um, you know, they are out for this, uh, you know, uh, equity business, which means equal outcomes. And again, there's, you know, if there, there's a, probably a reason why the uh, uh, em employees are, uh, you know, have the jobs that they do. Uh, well, in the past, anyway, and it's because they were qualified. It takes, you know, certain, you know, it takes smart people to do certain jobs. 
And you want to, you know, and if the smart people all happen to be Asians and whites for the most part, or skewed that way, then that's who is going to make up that portion of the workforce. And, uh, you know, we definitely don't want big government coming in and holding a club over your head saying, oh, you know, uh, you know, you have to have X amount of this and X amount of that, you know, the identity politics at play here in, in the workforce. Now they're doing this. They started it in the government. They're doing it now. That's what, uh, that's what this executive order is that uh, Biden signed. Uh, they're doing it here. And then guess what? what the, what's the next step? Anybody that does business with the government is going to have to meet those standards. And then sooner or later than the next step will be the, where they're just going to, they'll just outright say, okay, you have to, you know, you're going to have these quotas of all these different, uh, you know, identity politics groups. You're going to have to have so much percent of your workforce has to be transgender and so much has to be gay and so much has to be black and so much has to be Asian and yada, yada, yada. And again, circumventing, you know, the, the employer's right to choose who he feels uh, is the most qualified or the, will be, you know, be the best choice for his company. So again, that's, you know, I think we need to get rid of uh, this, you know, government, the step, <laughs> get rid of more government. You know, we don't need this much government in our lives. Uh, you know, all these, it's sad that all these, all these companies now in the United States and, and colleges and institutions now have to have the drag weight now of uh, somebody making, you know, a hundred grand a year, probably, or more being a, a, a director or, or executive of uh, diversity, inclusion, and, and equity and all that. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's like a tax put on, put on our, our companies. Now, you know, this is going to have to get passed on into the price of goods. So this is why we want to, <laughs> let's avoid government as much as we can, please. Let's just keep government in, uh, uh, the, again, the three main functions, uh, the three roles of government, uh, police, military, and the courts, and, uh, and, and little else. And one final thing I just wouldn't want to mention, I hope uh, I suggest everybody read as much Frederick Bastiat as they can, uh, his economic writings. I think he's from uh, the seven, late 1700s, early 1800s, somewhere in there. Um, and he explains quite well uh, the idea of, that was put forth in Jim's in, in Tim's movie about uh, investment in capital and how how it ends up actually being good for everybody when we actually invest in capital, even if it displaces people. And I believe the example Bastiat uses is a company that hires a new machine that is able to reduce the workforce by one. So, so this guy is now unemployed. And every, of course, all the liberals will be whining, whining about that. This guy is unemployed. But now the company will be able to lower the price of their products by, by the amount of that guy's wages. And by doing that, that gives consumers more buying power because they, now they have to spend less for that particular item. That means they have more buying power for something else. So now instead of maybe because they're spending less money on let's say shoes, if this was a shoe factory, now they're spending less money on shoes so they have more money to spend on theater tickets, for instance. So now there's more demand in the theater. For, there's more demand for labor in the theater market. And so maybe that guy that was unemployed at the shoe factory now gets a job somewhere in the theater industry. Maybe is, uh, you know, uh, part of the crew that does the lighting or maybe, uh, you know, selling tickets or, you know, who knows what, maybe acting, you know. And but so the jobs are created there. So as we reduce employment through because of uh, because of the productivity made possible by uh, you know improved capital equipment, uh, those displaced people will get 
other will get jobs in other areas of the economy now due to the increased consumer demand made possible by them having to spend less money for what was previously produced by where those people worked at, if you, if you follow that. Okay, and that's it. Okay, uh, okay, Charlie, you get the final rebuttal unless anybody else has anything to say. Charles, are you still there? I guess so. And uh, Dan and Alana, I know you're still there. So Charlie, uh, Steve, you don't wanna say anything still? Okay. Anybody else? Yes. All right, Charlie, you do closing remarks then. Okay, first of all, Tim, um, you began by saying you like the capitalist system. I do. Individuals to make money. Yep. Yeah, the 1%. It's a good system for the 1%. Not much value to 99%, but it's good for the 1%. Well, what kind of criteria are you using for what is good and what is bad? Uh, number two, uh, I've said this many times, we see this on social media, people have inventions. Everything seems to work perfectly in the cartoon, but not in the real world. In which world are you in? Are you in some cartoon world? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, in your cartoon world. But that's not where I am. <laughs> so stay in your cartoon world. And everything is fine and dandy, right? But this is a this is a this isn't a real world. This is animation. Um, the other thing is you cited the names of some big guys in charge of companies. You say this guy built this and this guy built that. I still I've told this story many times. I went up to Detroit, River Rouge, and took the tour and the tour guide said, Henry Ford built this factory. I was gonna say, that's amazing. He's a skillful guy. He can build this? No, I think there are about 10,000 guys who built that factory. And I think that 10,000 to 70,000 employees make those cars. That guy didn't do anything, hardly nothing probably. He didn't make one car. I don't know why we own anything. And last of all, I counted this in making your rebuttal. You gave three yes, but at least three yes, but constructions. Yes, capitalism is this, but now you're not really saying anything. That's invalid because you nullify the but nullifies the yes. So you don't make any progress. Yes, he's a good looking guy, but he's not a good looking guy. I mean, you contradict yourself within the same statement, the same assertion. And in essence, you don't say anything, which means led me to believe you couldn't come up with anything that was strongly in favor of it because each of them had a negative aspect. Well, it's okay if, but we, yes, but, yeah, it's a wonderful, but, come on, give me a break. All right, not speaking on you. Uh, Brian, I do not recommend companies to go on strike. Uh, it is a tenuous situation. I thought I'd spoken this before earlier tonight. I personally do not recommend doing anything, an alternative to the strike. You seem to think that it's uh, very easy to take a workforce and have them suddenly unemployed for perhaps extended periods of time of a year or so, 
without consequences, without thought as to what is going to occur. I mean, I, I dealt with them many, many times. I believe in federal mediation and conciliation, FMCS they call it. They call in a federal mediator, they generally present your case and he will, in one fashion or another, usually try, try to arrive at agreeable solutions that all can agree to. Not everyone is always happy. You have to learn how to negotiate. But as an alternative to the strike, most assuredly, uh, for every strike that wins, there's one that loses. So why would you do it? Well, that's what I mean. You walk away with something from the table. It may not be what you wanted. It never is. Your initial proposals, you rarely come away with what you wanted. But that's the way the world works. You sit down and you cut a deal. So basically, you try to arrive at the satisfaction of everyone. That's an orderly process, not this thing of uh, strikes and uh, shut them down and and all that. That that's an altercation. That's that's war. That's war. Anyhow, that Justin has got such a problem with. Anyhow, Bob, this notion that uh, an employer can refuse to recognize a union election. And you want to make this a permanent feature that they have some ultimate veto power, which exceeds the opinion of the workforce. Now talk about 1% having more authority than the 99. So the, you, I don't know why you are giving all this uh, authority to one person. Why? Are you, do you get something in return from him? That's ludicrous. Why should the needs and views of the 99 be cast aside for one? You like a cast. Because the one might be correct. You want social stratification? This is what you're arguing? A hierarchy? I know I'm higher. I'm arguing for a voluntary exchange. And if somebody doesn't like the uh, you know the way it's going at that company, he's free to pick up his toolbox and leave. The uh, if we vote a union, it should be recognized very simply. Uh, you don't have an inherent right to hire. It's with, with conditions. And you don't seem to acknowledge that. You think it's an absolute right. And no right is exercised in the absolute, in particular, the right to hire. Uh, and you want to give it, and I don't know why. That's what I mean. I can't figure out, are they, are they paying you something? Well, how come the, how come the Tesla employees voted not to unionize? Oh, they probably campaigned against it. They call each employee into the office. They know how they vote. They know who the ringleaders are. They say, let me talk to you. You don't want a union in here, do you? Do you, Bob? You don't want a union. Your boss calls you in one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, Bob, what do you think of this union? <laughs> huh? <laughs> what do you think of this union? You don't want a union, right? They're just going to take your dues and spend it on themselves, right? You don't want that union. You don't need it, right? I knew you're one of us. I can count on you. Uh, by the way, you want that day off? Well, you can have it. I approve your vacation. Since you're one of us, you know, and you've been at looking for that transfer. Okay, we'll send you over to that department. You've been wanting to, to get in the uh, engine department, so we'll send. It. 
So what do you think? Well, do they have captive audiences? Uh, and, you know, generally, you think they might not. I love this. There always are improved conditions of employment when the union shows up. Man, does they start suddenly. It's like Christmas. Didn't a, didn't a big, uh, wasn't there a big union vote at the uh, Amazon in Alabama and they refused the union there as well? Yeah, they, they, there's the same things at work. And if we, oh, the old one, that one was, if we unionize, when they have multiple locations, you want to vote a union, guess which location will be closed. It's like the steel strike years ago. Uh, the guy said if they voted a union in, he would immediately shut down Ludlow, his famous one, Little Steel, right in your neck of the woods. That the Frank Ludlow was it. He said if they uh, unionize, I will shut this place down. I love this, and he said, and I'm going to go off and grow apples. Instead, he promised, if you vote union, this mill will be closed. Now, you got to think about this for a while. What should I do? Does he mean it? And according to Tim, he has all the authority to do so. Now, they can move. That's what I mean. I'm no alibi for all of these actions. You win some elections, you know, there's always variables in every one. But there's classic example. When you negotiate contracts for for a, a, an employer which has multiple locations, um, you always know where that installation stands in the hierarchy. It might not have been making any money. It might have been unprofitable operation. It may be out of date. Uh, they may have been building another one right next door. Who knows? I don't know that corporation. That's one of the things you research. Uh, so they, yeah, there's many variables that can go in uh, that are, are going to affect how you vote. Yeah, what are they, what are they, what are they threatening the employees with? Did they give them anything? To, oh, we're going to be nice now. We, we found Jesus. And uh, concessions. To make concessions for the workforce. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, there's anybody that has profited more by the auto industry. Unionizing is, is the auto industry. I, I think you were, you, or no, you're, now actually the current field of battle is warehousing. We had that guy, Roberto Clark, Warehouse Workers for Justice. There's an awful lot of action going on with warehousing these days. Um, it's, that's the hot, the hot, hot issue because that's where our economy is going. And that's where the action is right now. I don't know too much more than that. I do get their emails. They have things, but particularly on the southwest side of the city, uh, these warehouse operations, big big box supply houses uh, are, are coming around. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I don't know why, oh, the new machine. There's another unions have never been opposed to technology. What they are opposed to is outplacement. I negotiate these things. If you want to come in and downsize the workforce, if you want to automate it, as a matter of fact, automation, it's been found, you may not find this hard to believe. Automation results in a better product, but it doesn't result and a reduction of the workforce. Now that's not an ironclad rule, but automation, new machinery, 
will result in less error rate, more consistent product quality uh, than can be done in a manual process. It doesn't necessarily reduce in a smaller workforce, like libraries. Public libraries I was involved in, we had automated systems for checking books in and out. I was in charge of the staff. I had the same staff I had at before they did and after we automated. Same amount of work, so it didn't really, they tell you that up front when you, when you deal with these. But you negotiate out placement, meaning we'll, we'll, we'll make a concerted effort to find everyone a job, we'll offer early out retirements, we'll offer a buyout package. Uh, buyouts are very popular. Uh, some of you will do that voluntarily. There's all kinds of ways you can have staff changes. Now you could say, I, I denounce new machine in here and tomorrow, See you around. See you around sometime. I hope everything's okay for you guys and gals. Take it easy. Or you can do something to ease the transition. There's even situations where you assign personnel officers to help the people get resumes, fill out applications, and apply for jobs. You could call around other industries things of that nature. And that's very often, I've been in many downsizing situations where everybody got a job. No one hit the bricks. No one did. You look at the workforce right up. Who's eligible for retirement? Who's in the middle, who's close to it? Uh, things like that early out. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of letting people down, a, a parachute instead of kicking them out the door, you have a parachute drop. Um, the, uh, now I don't know why you don't wanna pay what is standardly known as prevailing wage rate. Yes, you probably could have find someone who is desperate and willing to work for less. However, in fact, that's a form of theft, you're cheating. Somebody, I don't think you're a guy who says cheating is okay. I don't know. I would hope not. I think you're a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could cheat somebody out of. But there are studies done. That's how they do it. And they come up with the prevailing wages, wage rates, various operations and activities. And I, I don't know what's wrong. Are you unfair and equitable? Pay the prevailing wage rate. Yeah, don't look for some way to cheat, cheat somebody. Yeah, you think, yeah. I don't know. I, but that's not right. That's that's the system we shouldn't allow. Now, the last of all, you've been harping about this and harping and harping and harping. But about what is affirmative action? But did you ever ask yourself? Why would we find the need for quotas and affirmative action and, and things? Now, another one, by the way, when they hire EEO officers in companies or in government, those people are, are worthless because they will never fight against discrimination because they're an employee of the firm and they will never do anything to displease the employer. So any EEO officer, equal employment officer who isn't any good, isn't an EEO officer for very long. That's what they say. They don't, they don't really represent people. It's also very, discrimination also is very difficult, as I said, because you have to prove, the burden of proof is on you. You don't have access to records. You try and get other employees to testify and they are intimidated and they say, no, I would, they're worried about their jobs. So they don't say anything. They don't want to testify. They don't want to make statements. So how do you prove discrimination? You had no one, no one will, will say they saw this or that or overheard this or that. 
Now, the amazing thing is, you see no reason in the United States for actions taken by somebody to bring an end to discrimination. Now, don't you know the extent of discrimination against black people in the United States for decades, particularly in parts of the country? And you don't think that kind of stuff should be stopped? You don't think any action should be taken to say, no, you shouldn't mistreat people. Right now, your own Republican Party is trying to stop Black people from voting. No, they're not. Because they might vote Republican. So they think it's OK to stop people from voting. Now, given the evidence, now look what was done to the Asians. That's terrible. Uh, as your party tries, as the Democrats try to keep the libertarians off the and ballot, the I United try to keep it, it, it ah. the access law so high. I mean, get out of here with your democracy. And then, and then the Asians. Is tyrannical. And then the Asians. Tyrannical. Look what they did to the Asians. T Y R E N T. You could bring your dog in a place, but you couldn't, an Asian was not allowed. Hey, come on. And to say there shouldn't be something done to correct that? To allow market, that to go care. on? Let the free market take care of it, Charlie. We don't oh, need Oh, come on. This is human rights abuse. People are, that's the human mm -hmm. rights is more important than any profitability. People want a fair deal. They don't want to be told to get out of here. What if they want to go on strike? They got to ask the permission of the government. Where do you get they have to ask permission? Let, it, let him go. finish. We're outside the railroads, which got a deal. Anybody can go on strike outside of government employees whenever they want. Okay, guys. Now, I don't know. Wait a minute. I ain't done, Phil. All right, Charlie. But anyhow, this discrimination has to be reversed. It's not allowed. And this country is really bad. Man, what have we done? We're the, I hate to say this, I don't know if you could score this, but we're the most discriminating people I've ever been around. They come along and they say, well, we shouldn't do something about it. Are you for real? I mean, I'm not that big on these racial issues, but I can recognize that if somebody wants to change it, hey, I, I'm not going to say put them down. You, you think you, you know, think people are going to act against their own economic interests, Charlie? I have no idea what that means. Okay, well, let me give you an example. Branch, Branch Ricky, your Branch Ricky, black Ricky person for discrimination. Charlie, let me tell you. You want an example? Branch Ricky broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball and hired Frankie Robinson to play because he knew that Frankie Robinson would lead him to a World Series. Well, that doesn't, so, mean, that doesn't he, make him a nice guy. He, he was looking, he, no, that, that, he, he was looking is, at his he own didn't, back he didn't he care about he didn't People do were a, not gonna, he he didn't gonna do anything for, to end discrimination. He just wanted to win a fucking World Series. He wanted to win a World Series, and he also knew he also about a black a baseball jerk. player. He knew that by having a black baseball player, he would have he would fill the, more stands with black people and sell more hot dogs and more beer. So this was oh, a, so he just wanted to sell. He wanted to fill sell tickets to blacks. He yeah, he wanted to fill seats, and the he also knew he wanted to this. go to the World Series. The more you tell me about this guy, the more I think he's a big jerk. Branch Ricky? Well, he broke the color yeah. barrier. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't make you know, money. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying, Charlie. He let the free market work. Why didn't he break the... Then other teams, teams followed suit. They said, hey, we're going to do that. We're going to hire good players, no matter what color they are. Why didn't, he hire, why didn't he hire that guy simply because 
he wanted to end discrimination. Because so well, you, don't, you don't just hire somebody. Quality. He wanted to do something. Be a good player. He, he's not a champion of human rights, that's for sure. He's a champion of capitalism. Well, that made him a champion of of uh, human rights as well because his his action broke the you know, broke the color Listen, barrier. If you see a guy being discriminated against, and you say, "Hey, stop that! You don't need to make money on it." I go up to him and say, "Hey, stop doing that because it's the wrong thing to do. Judge on the quality of her character." Well, the thing is so, that, that you're using you're, using, and, you're saying using coercion. This nation is the Don't you think? Don't you think voluntary? Don't you think it's better to do things voluntarily than through coercion? No, there's a hundred years of coercion of black people, and you say you're coerced. Those people are champions at it. They're experts. Come on, coercion. Jeez, man. Do you realize what coercion? They shot him in the head down south. They got, they got out of hand. They shot them. Discrimination in this nation is terrible. What on? It's inconceivable that we let it go on as long as we did. A melting pot that doesn't have a domestic policy of fair and equitable treatment of it. Oh, we profess to. Oh, we've got up statues of liberty. <laughs> But it's just a friggin' statue. Come on. And perhaps Ricky, I I, I, didn't really, I don't know, oh, he is on the team. Well, he went down in my standing. This is a guy making money, that's all. He would have hired a bad an animal, anything. Like okay. build his seats. Come on. All right. Is that it? What are you Brian, what were you trying to say? I think uh, Brian is still there, but I think he may have uh, stepped away from his video. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Happy well, May well, Day. You know, I, I, I just want to say, I mean, it's just like, you know, so, you know, I don't dispute the anti-discrimination laws. I mean, those are necessary. There's been a lot of discrimination against black people in this country <clears throat> and other people. So, you know, I, I, I personally don't see a way other than the government would have stepped in and changed that because it ultimately was the government that, you know, provided for segregation and provided for slavery. Your old buddy government making things possible, making human rights abuses possible, you know, for many, 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 many centuries. So, you know, I mean, so it would have taken the government to fix that problem because it created the problem. Um, do, you, do you realize what would happen if there was no government in the South? There, there couldn't have been slavery. They'd be slaves. No, there, there couldn't have been because Didn't the government passed the law that said no slavery. Do you think the plantation owners would have done that on their own? The the slave owners needed the the force and power of the government to maintain so many people in servitude without the power of the government without the army without the police without the courts they Did could the not have maintained that system the cost would have been immense like the number of you know overseers that that they needed like for you know to maintain those plantations because they you know they were worried about the being cost killed. Of a slave driver so they, they needed the government. Without the police, without the military, they could not have maintained it. It wouldn't have been profitable. So it was your government, it was your buddy, the government. And then, and then the government went on with their separate but equal stuff, you know, Slavery that allowed black profitable. people to be treated as second class citizens. And then they went ahead and, you know, allowed, you know, provided, uh, you know, government loans for everybody except black people. I mean, it's like the government just goes on and on and on with these abuses. And every you time you just say, and, and then am the I, whole great society, minute, how'd that turn out? How'd the great am society I, turn out? Correct? The war on poverty. How's you the war on post? poverty going, Charlie? You I mean, you know, your old buddy government, government fixed that slaves. yet? Slaves. This is amazing. The, the government created that. To the government who freed the slaves. The government created the slaves. Without the government, <laughs> slavery couldn't have existed. Oh, God. That's right, Charlie. 
no, without no. the military, without the police, without the courts, slavery could not have existed. And, and so it's your buddy, the government, that made it possible, it's made it profitable. Groups. I know you don't like. I don't like. You like to like. Hey, you don't want to hear anybody bad mouth in the old, you know, the old the guy, government. <laughs> the government comes along and frees slaves, and the guy doesn't like it. They created goes, slavery, oh, Charlie. I mean, that's the off, point you missed. They're fixing the problem they created. Oh, these overseers, they want so much money. The cost of an overseer. I had never heard that before. It's a cost of doing business. I mean, if you were in that oh, business, that would be a cost to you. I got to hire a mean guy to push my slaves around. You know how much I got to pay those they, guys? Yes, Charlie, they actually did that. I mean, that was a, that's a fact. Yeah, well, why? Because government allowed them to do it. Because yeah. government allowed it. Because government created the classification of Black Americans as property. And the Without that came distinction of them as property, it. they would have had rights, including the right to bear arms. Okay. Now, it would have been very that's difficult that's to that's that's that, maintain that many people in servitude if they were armed, wouldn't it, Charlie? That would have been tough. Slavery had existed from ancient times until the governments came in and ended it. It's and created it. it. And created it. It was ended government it. in every one of those circumstances. Ended it was government, government that created it. Ended it. Not okay. but the slave owners did All not right. end slavery. Okay, before That's we go not down. Sensical. All right, we're we're down this rabbit hole again. That's crazy. All right, let's oh, so I think we ought to stop the slavery stuff, you know. Okay. Well, um, okay, guys. At this Some point, guys, South Carolina says, Well, I think we should stop this, yeah. Okay, anyway, we're going to, I'm going to uh, terminate and, and stop our tonight's college. We're going to keep going for a little while. We'll keep the call open for a little while. I'd like to wish everybody a good night. And we're going to stop recording at this point. All right. Thank you all very much.